we're popping YouTubers at the time. And then we get this TV deal after doing some pilots. You're familiar with TV, traditional media. See, it's called traditional media now, like a bygone era where you got mad cameras. The lights are huge. These cameras are this big to shoot food. How do you shoot your food? <laughs> Phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're filming, but we got a showrunner, a producer. We got kind of someone that's like, hey, can you say this brisket ramen in Denver cooked by this guy is like the best you've ever had? My bro's like, no, I'm not saying that. Six years ago, people would ask us, hey, do you think you're going to do YouTube forever? Guys, we just got this shit popping. What are you talking? Why? First of all, I'd always tell him, what makes you say we can't do YouTube in 10 years? Hey everybody, what you're about to watch is the Full Creators Lunch Podcast. You can find more of their podcasts down below. It's hosted by Jay Key Cho of Righteous Eats and Brian Lee. I had a really good time. Uh, I felt like I was very honest in it. We talked about being OG YouTubers, kind of uh, how we view the current TikTok or Gen Z generation. Uh, and also, also, how about starting an Asian media network? What would that be like? And we talked about all of that in this podcast, so check out more from their podcast at the link down below, but this is our episode. You know, we, we think that the right now is the death of the middle, right? And, yeah. and, and, and streetwear is sort of middle, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, LVMH is higher profits, higher market cap than ever before, mm -hmm. but, you know, anyone in the middle, you either have to be that where you promote exclusivity and prestige mm -hmm. or on the other end you have to promote accessibility and, and utility right so Shein and you know uniqlo and h and m and 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 actually like old navy uh -huh. they're having record profits but if you're banana republic or if you're a streetwear brand where you're charging 60 dollars for a t-shirt but you're not lvmh it's going to be really hard how about this i'll be more specific what do you think about the death of the gigantic juggernaut middle because I think totally. that there's a lot of brands that are still in the middle, but it's now dispersed across a bunch of different like personal brands. Like everybody, all of our friends, like we have like probably at least 10 friends or five friends who have like really good brands that are more in the middle price that are doing well for themselves, but maybe they won't turn into these juggernauts. I love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So I call it the barbell theory, right? In order to succeed and by success, you're right. I'm thinking of success meaning scale. Right, you know, so like to, a, almost like a public company. Yeah. yeah. Well, sure. scale meaning like hit masses, right? Yes. Whether you're in media, whether you're in tech, whether you're in food, whether you're in fashion, everything. If you're in the middle right now, you're you're screwed. If you're trying to hit scale. Yes. Right. Yeah, I agree. So you have to either be a fast casual or QSR, mm -hmm. or you could be, you know, fine dining. Yeah. That, which is which should get more and more expensive and become more and more of an experience. Mm -hmm. that, that shit's never gonna go away. Yeah. The thing that's gonna be, if you're like a mid, so you make like really good food that's like kind of expensive, but you're not all the way, yeah. then you're fucked. If we're talking like millions and billions of dollars, I think it's totally in the barbell yeah. sides. Yeah. People in the middle will still have their space, but it's gonna be more of like almost a, they can live a good life. I think they're gonna enjoy themselves. Yeah. I have a lot of friends in the middle still, but um, yeah, my girlfriend got a puffer jacket. I saw, she was like, guess how much this was? Like eighteen dollars. I was like, "What? Yeah, can't be good for the environment. It's definitely not good nah. for the environment. Yeah, but uh, yeah, looks good. Yeah, they call it what it, it, it used to be fast fashion. Now it's like it's like my, like hyper fast or whatever. It's like it's just split second split fashion. Second, yeah, no, nah, it's like future fashion. It's like before you even see it. Yeah, I knew, like I knew a girl who uh, she had factory contacts. Like her parents ran factories in China. Her whole thing was they would show a photo on Instagram and you could see all the engagement. And so you can actually, it doesn't exist, but you can see all the engagement. So she's like, oh, you know what? Well, why don't we just, if Kylie Jenner is wearing it and that got a lot of engagement, why don't we literally take that, make it, model it on a, on a post it and then sell it there. And then by the time the factory is just in time production, they'll get all of it that day. And because because the life cycle of a sale, like you're not going to sell that classic piece for you know five years, right? right. So it's not going to go for resale. Yeah, yeah to, exactly. Yeah. You're going to get majority of that sales within like let's say the first week. So like you're already you started it, you put it out, and you're done yeah. within the first week. I don't know if she's still around, but you're right. It it, it doesn't even exist. It's not even it's not even fast. That's fashion. insane. That's like yeah. a, as fast as food. Yeah. You're like, hey, I want a burger, and this one's like, I'll make it. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Ten minutes later, you got a burger. 
Totally. Yeah. But except instead of something that goes in your body, it's just like it's clothes that exist forever. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and that's what brand, I mean, so again, I, you know, we have righteous eats and we obviously do a lot in food, but like our vision of the world is a world in which like, yeah, you can, you make a brand today and that it just goes because at the end of the day, what is it? It's, it's being able to market it's acquisition costs. And, yeah. You know, Jake, he's here, he's pulling up. Um, that, that's kind of how the world by the way i don't know vibe wise if this is like too too much too soon but like yeah typically know, this whatever is, let's do it shit that we we, up, we, up, we talk about thanks for uh finally dropping in i appreciate up, it jakey for inviting <laughs> me to a podcast and thankfully you showed up <laughs> <laughs> how you doing man good man hey what? so how do you guys know each other you guys know each other right yeah i think it's bad rap Right, yeah. We were, uh, who's the girl that was working on it? Salima, she's the director, yeah. Shout out to her. Salima met us in LA in 626 when we were there, and we filmed our little part. And I believe that's probably the first time, like, I had known, I guess I knew that you were part of it, you were in it, all that stuff. Yes, likewise. I mean, I wasn't too familiar with uh, YouTube creators, Mm -hmm. just overall. Like, I just knew Dumb because, you know, he was a friend, but... And then um, Salima was like, yo, we should um, interview uh, the Fung Bros. And I wasn't familiar with y'all work at the time. And then I learned about it. And then um, I think it was like a few years later, I saw you guys just randomly in New York. And uh, I believe I introduced myself. And then we were just chopping it up. And ever since then. Was that at Fat Buddha? I think so. It probably was. I remember talking to you at Fat Buddha outside. It probably was. Yeah, shout out to Cliff. So yeah, so I think that's how we first met, and then ever since then we would just randomly bump into each other and different. Yeah. For some reason, I always thought that you guys were stationed in LA just mm-hmm. because of your YouTube presence and your overall like the content, a lot of the content yeah. that you guys were made, you made, and um, but you you've been stationed out in New York for the last six seven years well i i think you guys did a stint then left then did a stint again is that correct we went back and forth to new york multiple times so we've actually this is our technically third time moving to new york but this is the longest stint i want to be here for a a while if not forever right when they started opening up that 35 percent indoor dining with the shields Uh you know and then that's when we had moved to New York and we got like a cool deal on our apartment. So we were like, yo, we gotta go. Cause we spent the 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 bulk of COVID in yeah. LA, you know. But yeah, I mean LA great for a lot of different reasons which we could talk about, but uh I'm glad I'm here. Yeah. I how's your brother doing by the way? Dave is good. Dave is yeah. good. He is in the city. I'm a, you're the younger brother. I'm right? the younger yeah. brother. So I have a younger brother and we're about like eighteen months apart. And okay. uh, I love him. That's but, fairly close. Yeah, I love him, but I don't see myself ever having a long-term working relationship with him. And he's aware of this too. Like this is not new. Hundred percent. This is in. <laughs> he's not gonna watch this and be like, Nah, not at all. This I thought is, you'd never say that, big bro. Nah, not at all. So he he's very he's very aware of it. So I was curious, like you've worked with your brother on building a business for the last decade plus plus more yeah Yeah. so how does like that dynamic work out and do you guys still live together yeah we still currently live together i would say man i know that for as much time that we've spent together and worked together and just grew up together and hung out with each other like i think that it is uncommon to see brothers to be honest like do it like this and especially asian brothers and especially to be honest chinese brothers like i think it's even less it just gets less and less common so i think that um, I think we both deserve credit for that. I think that's cool. I think um, that we're different enough people so we can kind of like complement each other to an extent. It's That's not to say we haven't had our arguments and our flare-ups and all that stuff, but you know, I think we're very like mission focused. And at the end of the day, we grew up hanging out with each other. And you know, David being the older brother, he's been a big, he helped me obviously get into a lot of the stuff. Like I got into, the stuff that he got into, but earlier on in my life, right? Because I'm a little bit younger. So we started playing basketball at the same time or we started getting into rap and like hip hop at the same time because if he got into it at the time, I was getting into it. Can I ask how big is the age gap? How many years apart? Uh, It's like two. Two years? Okay. Okay. So it's like, it's actually close enough to still be friends with each other's friends. Mm. You know, we're not like that. We're not like seven years apart where it's like now it's like almost a... Uh, half a generational difference you know what i mean or like a cultural difference yeah i mean definitely i mean i understand why people don't work with family though because like some of those talks or arguments or disagreements that we've had or like 
I could see how that would tear certain people apart. Totally. But it didn't tear us apart. Because I think that it's just like any other relationship. Like if you have a business partner, right? You're going to have, you guys going to disagree on certain things. But how do you guys resolve that? Right? And that's pretty much like people say the same thing about a marriage too, you know? So um, we say we're married all the time. I mean, yeah. a business. If you're really in a true business and you're truly trying to build, like we we were married, exactly. We're no. married. I'm married in life and I'm married in business. That's like, your that's work, your work husband. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's no, it's essentially 100%. a Catholic wedding. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean, you know, like if you're going into a business with somebody, yo, like you're not looking at it. Well, you share a bank a, account. You yeah. share. There's no prenups. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, this is this is what this is. Yeah, yeah. especially yeah. going fifty fifty. There's well, unless you guys. Well, uh, so here's the thing. Like when we ask that question, I think so. I ask out of wonderment and out of like, I admire that so yeah, much, right? Yeah, I, I definitely admire that. Huge yeah. admiration yeah. because I think, um, this is just my take, but like, I think there's nothing whacker than when siblings don't get along, right? Yeah. 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 Like, and you see that shit all the time. And mm -hmm. I don't, again, I don't know if it's cultural, but it's like, oh, I can't stand my brother or yeah, oh, yeah, fucking yeah. I hate my sister or whatever. I'm just like, the, what, what kind of like, what, what happened that, you, like, literally your, the people that you grew up with, you're not tight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But I, yeah. I agree 100%. Like, you ask, what was so serious that happened? Yeah. Now, obviously, there could be these little internal dynamics. There's, like, jealousy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Envy. Oh, you were treated yeah. this way from mom and dad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all that stuff. That's all can be kind of true and have happened, uh -huh. but also doesn't fully justify. You know, but also, you're right. It's on the parents to kind of do things that bond them together. Like I have two nephews. Mm -hmm. As an uncle, I, w I am gonna feel some of that mission to be like, no, these guys gotta be at least bros. Wait, they don't wait, have to work together yeah, like wait, me and so, David. So you have your brother, and do you have a sister? Yeah, I, have older I, sister. I found oh, okay. out today. I didn't okay, know. Yeah, I just you. slipped that in. Yeah, yeah I have an yeah. older sister who has two kids. Cause boys. I was like, David lives with Joe and he has kids? Like, you know what I mean? Oh, like, not yet. Yeah, not, not yet, yet. Like, guys. Uh, but you. like, yeah, so I agree that that's super whack. And I think that uh. sometimes in Asian families, there is a lot of competition. And not to say that parents mean it to turn out this way, but parents do train both of their, like all their kids to be very competitive and then not. <laughs> and here's the other thing that a lot of traditional Asian parents don't build into their um, children is like them having conflict resolution. I think conflict resolution uh, really, it, it, there's like none of it in our parents' generation in at least a, a Western sense, like yeah, well, what communicative way. Yeah, well, what do you mean conflict? No, <laughs> there's no conflict, right? Like, uh, stuff is edict. When they say stuff, that's the way it goes. Like, you, there's no questioning. You're right. When you're, when you're like, you know, I, I always think there's no struggle. There's no nothing. This is all just a part of part of it. And by the way, there's wisdom to that. There's wisdom to the calling of something bigger than themselves. But then, dude, that there's also like the burden of that too, right? So when I say like. One thing that I used to always ask my grandma or my grandmother, especially be like, Hey, tell us when, you know, so what was it like? You try to understand. Right. And she's like, why do you want to know about that? That's all in the past. Why do you want to know about that? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, uh, there's no, there's no conflict. You know what I'm saying? There's no conflict resolution. You guys shouldn't be fighting. You know, we, we, we talk about this stuff all the time. Like, like mental health, for example. Right. Dude, like why, why you talk to somebody? Like, what do you mean? Like you, you know, you don't in in our communities, in Asian communities, none of that. You know, you don't you don't talk about any of that stuff. You're just like, this is what it is, and that's that's what it is. I mean, right? You yeah, mean it's kind of. Like I don't even think it's an Asian that. thing. Maybe it's just like. I well, mean, it's we, definitely we, an we, Asian we, thing. It's we, definitely an immigrant thing. It's yeah, definitely it's a an class immigrant thing, thing class probably, thing. Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, you don't you don't like share dirty laundries outside the crib. You know, like whatever that. But, happens but what I mean is like stays between the couple. You know what I mean? But what I'm saying is, I think I think the point that Andrew was trying to make was like when you and your brother fight, right? There wasn't a time where you guys sat down and said like, okay, so what happened? Right. What right, do you guys right. really did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But by the way, that that is all of that. That what I'm mentioning. That's a that's a privilege thing. Like, if you're trying to survive and as an immigrant family, you think you have time to sit down? Oh, with your you're kids? just saying it's like an yeah. unsaid, undiscussed thing. So like, people just drift apart in families, and then like, I think on the outside as like a kid, you're like wondering why. But you're just like, yeah. And then like nothing happened. But we just don't. Like we just don't. We don't talk about right, F with right, each other right, like right. that. And I'm just like. <laughs> Yeah, so you're right in the sense that there's zero discussion of it. Yeah, yeah. totally. Which is weird. And, but it but, seems like you guys have a lot of discussions because you guys are not only brothers, but y'all business partners as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, people view the world differently. I think there was this one quote that always stuck with me for years. It was like, do you view the world as a battleground or as a playground? And that 
says a lot about you. Now, now always seeing things as a battle is not necessarily healthy, a lot of cortisol, a lot of stress for you, and like maybe you're a little antsy and you're not like good with people or whatever, and that can be effect, that could affect you in that negative way. But if you see things as a playground, you're not really gonna take things seriously and you don't see like how the world actually works. Because like the truth is there is game theory. The truth is that there are maybe not like ops in the physical way, but there are people who are gonna be a barrier to you. You know, I mean, like, I'm not like trying to preach like 48 laws of power or whatever that stuff is, but I'm just saying like, we all understand that there is adversaries or struggles or barriers to getting what you want in life, right? So uh, if, you're, if you're in a playground mindset, you're just gonna think about how to have fun and like just make the best of your situation, which is not wrong, that's good, you need people like that, but then also to see it like a battleground, that means like you're gonna work through these things. It's like if we're on a platoon together, mm -hmm. it don't matter if we hate each other and we don't like each other, it's like mission first. So that's a very interesting question and a theory, but like, so do you guys both have the same view or a different view? Because I, I could see it being good for either. Yeah, I think we view the world mostly, we can agree mostly on how we view the world. Maybe not 100%, but I think like, I don't know, arbitrary, so do you see 85%. It as, do, do you wow. see it as a playground or a battleground? If you want to do something in life that is difficult, you have to almost see it kind of as a battleground. Yeah, I don't see how else, especially as like a kid who's not ultra privileged, who's a minority, who's like, you know, and different minorities have different struggles, but it's like, if you don't come from a place of privilege in that field, then, I mean, you have to just work and you have to get through, you have to get through the mud. How do you get through the mud? Like sometimes you gotta crawl in the mud yeah. And if crawling in the mud is something that you just so hate. I have friends in LA who like visited uh, one of the houses that we were living at a long time ago. Um, and he comes from a little bit better background, I guess, financially. And then he was like, he's like, oh, dude, if I had to live like this, he's like jokingly, dude, if I had to live like this, I'd just quit. Yeah. And I was like, see, that never even occurred to me. You know, I'm I'm always looking at things from the from the angle of gray. You know what I mean? So like, I feel like a basketball game is a playground where people partake in it as a battle in That's many good ways. Point. So, but you don't have a leaning. Yeah, I don't necessarily have a leaning. Yeah. Cool. Where are you? My leaning, I, and I've gone on both. And, sides and of you that. can be both at yeah, the different yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. I think it is a continuum, and I think you're gonna you're gonna vacillate between the two sides. But I think. I, my my default is looking at life as a battleground. Speaking of battleground and playground, I'm curious, man. Like, like how did the whole YouTube thing happen? What did it happen because it was a playground that you guys just wanted to have fun? Where did y'all go into YouTube thinking like, yo, we're gonna start our own channel, we're gonna kill it, we're gonna take out the competition? Can I guess what it was? I actually think go you guys guess. were probably. Because I'm pretty familiar, and I think we came from the same time, right? Yeah. So, like, we were in the we same place. We definitely ran into each other yeah, in LA yeah. multiple yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, same yeah. time, same place. I, the, the thing... A lot of people don't know. You're like a... You want to... People want to call me a YouTuber OG. You are like a OG OG Thank from you. maybe Thank the you. more the background yeah, side. Definitely. You move... <laughs> You've been a move maker and a wave maker thank you, in thank that you. space for, for many, many years. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, and, and again, I think back then, I thought it was all about um, doing it behind the scenes. Like, you know what it is? You know, it's like, uh, you could be the guy, but I always wanted to be the guy in the room that no, but that only the people that should know know. You know what I'm saying? That's cool. It's like, yeah. like a real G moves in we silence, need you. right? We need people like you. Yeah, but then now, everyone needs to have a platform and a community, and if you're not, if you're not advocating for yourself, you know, or even just giving game out at scale, then what are you really doing? So finally, 15 years later, you're like a YouTuber now. Funny. <laughs> yeah, super you're funny. social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, now, yeah. now you're a social media guru. Now you get. But to let's go back to the question. You said that you were you were. About go ahead, to guess. guess. Well, if it was gonna I, I think battleground. I, I think battleground, and I think one of the things that always stood out about you guys, uh, you and David, was you guys were very driven at like getting it done. For me, it was so obvious that you guys were also extremely hardworking and very driven towards getting what you guys wanted. And that literally started by saying, oh, wait, I think this YouTube thing is kind of popping off in LA. We're going to move there. We're going we're gonna to move there. And not only are we going to move there, we're going to go to every party. 
we're gonna go we're gonna reach out and like unapologetically and say like oh shoot and and i was telling him earlier like first thing i saw was when uh they reached out to teddy you know yeah. teddy's D- a friend david interviewed yeah. teddy z and yeah. that was like right and that's just on some like why not because Teddy at the time was studio head doing all these things and they're unapos- They're like, oh, I'm going to do this. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, they already see it. And then uh, they're just going, going, yeah. collab, this, that, building channels, uh-huh. building new formats. So I don't know. I, when I look at that, I, I'm probably like, I'm thinking that seems way more battleground strategic than just having fun. Yeah. I mean, I kind of agree. I mean, you kind of nailed definitely part of it is like. I think for us growing up in Seattle, we had so much like energy for entertainment. We were we were involved in live entertainment, hosting all the gigs. Like I opened up for Big Sean his first time in Seattle. That's very weird to say now that you know who I am right now. It's a different time, different time. But so it's like, man, doing all that stuff, we just had a hunger for it. And we actually, to be honest, I think naturally we're going to lean into stand-up comedy and music. Uh, Wait, hold on. Go back a little bit. Where, where in Seattle y'all grew up? Like South Seattle, South Side. Kent is a suburb south of Seattle. Okay. Um, but we went to UW, uh, lived on campus. Like very, I'm not going to say I'm the most Seattle person. I think I still rep for Kent too, but I, I just say Seattle. Obviously. Right, right. So you went to UW and like what y'all study over there? Like y'all, uh, y'all both of y'all no, went to UW? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just oh, went okay. to, we ended up graduating from business school. I mean, I was biochem at first, but you know, dreams of being a doctor can get crushed very easily in those weed out classes. Okay. So, but I'm glad that wasn't my path. So then we just do business school, but we weren't going to be great consultants because we were just not, that wasn't our passion. Like we were right. spending all our time doing entertainment on campus. Like and, what kind and of, luckily, like, what, like doing shows? Yeah. Like, just, like hosting, David was doing, started, he, David started doing comedy first and uh, we were all kind of making songs and doing music. Were you AGC? Like you guys were in frats, all that kind of stuff? Nah, too? nah, like, nah. Not the Asian frats. I mean, we were cool with them, but like same. definitely doing our own thing because we're just like, we were kind of always our own like uh, solar system, I guess, you know? And so we were not the Fung Brothers back then. Uh, nobody really called us that. They would say Andrew and David. So then we hosted this show retro open mic which was actually not even an asian show at all it was actually predominantly black and it was like that and shout out to jaleesa trap who like helped put us on but that was like passion that was a, such a cool project for us and and uh we grew a lot from that that was essentially it was essentially like deaf poetry comedy slam together where you got musicians and open mic it was like an urban open mic essentially so you guys were constantly organizing but you guys at the same time y'all had like this drive yeah. to be entertained i would say getting a lot of reps in right yeah and and that entertainment bone was always in us but we always also had like and shout out to my brother he always he always had the super macro visions but it was it was still always rooted in like explaining being asian and always being pro asian and never we never strayed from that you know we never tried to do anything that we thought was selling out just for a laugh or if we did we'd go back and revise that if i did like we would have a conversation ah, that's not that's not the mission right so fast forward we were we i did a little bit of youtube but not the fun bros youtube channel anyways youtube starts popping i pick up uh wong fu productions is uh doing a presentation at our college i asked to go pick them up Cause I'm like, yeah, let me pick them up from the airport in my mom's minivan. Like it's cool. So I pick them up and then we just connect and just talk and they're cool guys. Um, and I got a lot of love for them. And uh, from there, it just kind of like the brain starts going and it's like, what am I going to do after college, blah, blah, blah. And then actually David has a stint where he goes to China after he uh, graduates China and Taiwan to do some things out there. Cause he had like knew some people from his study abroad and he was like, yo, like China's like the next like hip hop's popping off, maybe that would be cool. So then I'm like, oh man, I gotta go to LA because I actually, my Chinese, I just didn't study Chinese like that. So I'm just not as Chinese to be, I just didn't, I didn't do the work. So I, I, it wouldn't have made sense for me to take that route. But I was like, yo, look, I'm gonna go to LA and maybe do acting or like stand up. That's what I was thinking. But then YouTube started popping and like kept jumping them and we were like, oh, this is actually cool. Like what like we could do it ourselves and these are guys who are like doing it and we're like this seems like cool let me join the thing so we move to la we pack up our our accord honda accord we drive down there kind of like a typical hollywood story less of a youtuber story a lot of youtubers they blow up in their hometown and then they move to la with some following Mm -hmm. we're we're going there brand new 
Y'all were op- y'all were opposite with it. Y'all basically went went there with the dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Trying to trying to make kind it of at a Hollywood. plan, but I don't want to say ultra strategized. But we did have a plan in mind. So we go there and we network and do all that stuff. And then, um, so let me ask you this: When you went out there, like, did y'all have like money saved up, or did you just hold jobs. up? Like, just nah, work I was work, odd I, jobs. I was selling women's shoes at Nordstrom, so I know all the nice salon brands. I know how a lady's foot fits <laughs> mm-hmm. into the espadrille, mm-hmm. wedge, or whatever that. And then uh, David was working at uh, multiple different, like, wireless, like Verizon, AT&T, whatever. So let me ask, so again, like, this is, I don't, I don't want to go into the stereotypical trope, but now my, into, I like so, stereotypes. So, yeah. so, 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 so my parents now watch YouTube, so they know what that is. They know that, wow, these people in Korea is making millions of dollars exactly. being YouTubers. So they understand what that concept is now. Yeah. Back then, this was what, late 2000, aughts? 11, like 2011. 2011. So YouTube wasn't even in the psyche of our parents, you know, at, the, at this it time. It essentially didn't exist. Yeah, and even amongst our community, like YouTube was something that, like it was just like some internet shit that we didn't really grasp what it could be. At, yeah, at least now it's like, oh, you're a YouTuber. Maybe, maybe oh, Brian okay. did, but I definitely well, did I'm, in well, 20 I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying so, Andrew did. Yeah, he did, you did too. But my, my question is like, how did you make that jump and just be like, oh, this is like where it is because you was on road to be a pre-med student and now you are taking odd jobs selling women's shoes and making videos and putting them online like how did how did you make that conviction or even convince your close friends and family i mean i think it helped that i was doing it with my bro of course right. you know and it helps each other because i think if i was going to go down there by myself it would have been a pretty different story um so luckily david comes back and he's like yo you're moving to la right let's move down together i was like oh this sounds great cool like with the bro so us being a two-man system, it was in a way not as lonely, but still very lonely because we could kind of operate on ourselves. So we didn't like blend into anybody else's system. We were doing our thing. And uh, but basically like taking that chance, I guess to answer your question is uh we just knew it was our passion. Like if you just look at our track record, that's just what we were into. Like, like if you just look at where you spend your time, that's why that like when when I don't know who said it first. Mark Cuban was like, oh, um, don't just follow your dreams. It's not about your dreams. Your dream dreams are like, oh, I, I dream of this. What are you passionate about? What have you proven to put your 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 time into Word. and your effort? Yeah. That's the thing you're actually passionate about because oh. you already do it, even if you didn't do it at a high level, mm. right? So clearly our passion was this thing. right? And so we were able to, put that on the channel, right? We did music videos that got popular, whatever, like, you know, they were like fun little, like, you know, now I look at them, some some of them were cheesy, but I was like, yeah, it works, this is cool. The message was there. And then it's like, so I guess our confidence was just like, our parents didn't stop us. They kind of saw us going to LA as a grad school thing. <laughs> like, okay, do that for like a couple yeah, of years and then come yeah, back, yeah, real, parents get a real job. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was an engineer okay. for uh, years. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. um, so then after that, I guess, I guess our parents didn't hold us back. Right. Right. They didn't like it. They didn't understand it. To this day, my dad pitches like, hey, you guys want to go to grad school? Like, you know, <laughs> and like write a thesis on entertainment. And then maybe I'm like, that. that's not how it works. Yeah. That's how your dad talks. <laughs> kind of. No, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, 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 he's yeah, yeah, from yeah. Hong Kong, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So he still has that like <laughs> British Hong Kong accent. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, basically, yeah, after that, we just, you know, we're in the mix and uh, running around all those circles. You probably saw us running around and uh, doing whatever we can. Explain the YouTube scene in LA Man. at the time. I have no idea what it was. I knew we were going to talk only about saw this for like an hour. Why? Right. I only saw it from, from, from a distance. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I was still in traditional media at the time. YouTube was this thing that was popping. I recall it was a white rapper named Hoodie Allen. You know, yeah, and yeah, yeah, Macklemore yeah. and all those guys, like, you know, Watsky and all those guys. Yeah. And I know that was like a movement that was happening. And then you had the Asian yeah, rap side, yeah, D-Pride yeah, you guys, Crazed you know. So Crazed. I only saw it Tim, from a distance. Yeah, Tim, Tim. You know, Tim, and then obviously from my lens of coming in from prestigious New York media, I was like, oh, this is a little cheesy. I don't really know what this is. Yeah. But you guys were in the midst of it. You guys were in the paint. Like, paint that picture for the audience that 
you know that has no idea what that is. I mean, what do you want to know about? I it? mean, just give us a give us a scope of the landscape. Like, I think it was like a golden era of people trying to figure stuff out, and right. I think that a lot of, um, you know, I mean, I look I look back on that time super fondly, and I think a lot of that stuff is the blueprint for what's happening now and for what will happen, right? right? I guess if you look at it, like different platforms had their golden era, like early TikTok, early Instagram Reels, early Vine. It was probably a similar but not as glorious because it was the first kind of platform before those came out that people were collaborating on. There was different voices being heard and like it was in the early days. So I guess like, I mean, it's just like any scene of like early rap, like that's, People are figuring out the tone. Oh, we don't even know like all the Mr. Beast techniques of thumbnails yet, like and, and watch time. Like none of that analytics stuff came out, right? Um, one, the NBA now it's all about analytics too. So it's just everything gets more analytical and numbers based. But I think back then there was a an air to just like, yo, who's who? Like, oh, you trying to do it? Yeah. And I don't know. I'm not gonna say it was like a glory land. I don't know what you like, it was nothing like uh yeah, there wasn't actually that's much, 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 that much money. There yeah, wasn't so, as many brands in it, but yeah, there was like a hyphen magazine that was doing uh, parties or like. But there's way more events now with Gold House and all these different like. Yeah, way but more like, money. how are you yeah. guys making money as YouTubers at the time? Nah, we did. I mean, it was AdSense and Brand Deal, same thing, but it was early days. Uh, so like our first brand deal was with Ninety Nine Ranch. Shout out tonight. We did it for a, a music brand, and that's how I met our current uh, agency, Mylin from Click Now, who now helps a bunch of creators get get deals so we've been with her for a long time but that was our first brand deal and it was gift cards mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't get money from 99 ranch because 99 ranch shout out to you guys they didn't give us cash but they gave us like thousands of dollars at 99 ranch so, so we were like so your first brand deal was paid via gift cards yes by 99 ranch by 99 ranch how, how many how much were the value of the gift cards thousands of dollars thousands yeah, of five, dollars like, worth like, of 99 know, ranch gift, in gift cards, gift cards. Yeah, you got to pay tax on that gift card by the way did i, <laughs> I of course you did of yeah. course you did of course you did yeah. um, get a good cpa guys yeah but yeah so anyways i guess uh we're working two jobs uh both working full-time uh David quits earlier to lead the channel, and then I'm doing. I'm working because I have a flexible schedule, and uh, I make decent commission at, at selling salon shoes, footing, putting Mew Mews and and Valentinos on women's foot. So then I uh, then I quit, and then we're going full time, and we're just like chugging along, and then like. But you only had a 99 ranch deal. What made you guys be like, yo, we're gonna go full time? Oh, what, we what saved. Was, I saved was, up. Was AdSense starting to pop, uh, pick up? AdSense a little bit, but yeah. really, I I just saved up, and you know, you just save up, and you just take that leap. you have to take everybody has to take a leap at some points whether it's a big leap a small leap you got to take a jump and we jumped yeah you guys never signed with an mcn either right we did we were with maker early on you were yeah maker was our mcn for a long time and then they <laughs> went down who so was your left. how did i who was your uh point, point uh, i think the it. first guy was uh i want to say his name was adam chill a chill white dude kind of tall adam was cool but he no no Ben Bezene. Do you know Ben? Know ben ben yeah, yeah, was our ben. very first That's actually. So funny. Okay. Ben's a comedian now and he's yeah. hilarious. Shout out to Ben. Um, I mean, you guys were OG YouTubers, very successful. I call it second wave OG. S second wave OG. Wang Fu, Tim, Kev Jumba, first wave of the Asian YouTubers. Totally. Yeah. Oh, Ryan Higa, of course. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That's great. What what wave are we on now? Well, I think this next wave includes all the different platforms in TikTok. So, I, honestly, I lost track when TikTok dropped. I don't know. We're on like fifth, sixth wave. I don't know. Yeah. In, in Asians. In yeah, Asian I'm just talking about Asians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asian like, Americans. Like this. Let's just, our fifth generation. Yeah. Fine. Are you go. up on the newest generation, by the way? I think Jeremy and Nectar, those guys, they're part yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine four nine. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, older I would guys, say yeah. so. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jeremy's even older. Like, they're yeah, even Jeremy's older, older yeah. but in terms of him and his brand being a personality-driven <laughs> platform yeah. or content yeah. uh, content channel, yeah, I would say. The, Jer Jeremy yeah. came right. He makes great content. Mm -hmm. Oh no, he's great. I love it's, Jeremy. It's good job. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Ethan is. He, do you know Ethan Uncurated? I think Ethan is like a generation after. Cause even the way he approaches stuff, like his though his perspective, like if me and Chris Cho are in the same wave, yeah, you know what I mean? Like oh, Ethan Chef Chris and Cho? yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. If I we're in the same wave, that. like 
the way that Ethan makes content and the way he approaches things is so funny. I wonder very what, different. I wonder what wave you're in then. I don't even know, dog. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? I guess I'm wave, whatever the wave that Chris was, you know, so funny. picking up on TikTok because I started in 2020. You know? But when you when's your wave come? When's your peak? Like I, I don't want to say peak, but I, wave. Like we yeah. all have seen waves come and go. It's like surfing, you know. Like yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, so you gotta paddle out, paddle, paddle. Yeah. You see a wave, jump on it, ride that, yeah. ride, I mean, it, ride it, ride it, ride it, ride it. The number that I got to right now is essentially all accumulated in twenty between twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty two. So it was like that two year window. Okay, and I've been kind of stagnant for the last two years. Okay, um, whereas Righteous Eats as a channel has grown. Can, can we actually do that as a fun exercise? So if if the, you guys are second wave, who who is in the third wave? Third wave is uh, I don't know if you know uh, Lean to D, uh -huh. Richie Lee. Richie runs a really big um, D to C clothing brand right now. He kills it, man. Richie, I'm What's so it proud called? of him. Rich, Richie Lee collection. Oh, okay. Rich. Uh, I'm wearing its jeans right now. Oh, word? Yeah. That's what's up. Um, yeah he makes that's like what's up. cut and sewn. It's not like a t shirt brand. Uh, but uh, Richie and then. And this uh, person is based in LA? No, nah, Seattle. He's our boy okay. from Seattle. Say we, word. Helped, we helped launch his channel in, in LA. He came down because he saw us doing our thing. And Richie is my best friend since like third grade. Mm. A lot of and, Seattle uh, pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Vietnamese guy. Always into cool stuff. Always had great style. Always right. hilarious. I, I thought he was funnier than me on on a uh, personal level and then um he uh he was like yo i see you guys are doing a youtube thing like i'm just worried like i want to like come down and like see what's up and then david's like yo, yo yo come down move 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 down hurry hurry, hurry. <laughs> and then we're like all right let's do it and then we're just like putting richie through the uh the the boot camp you know and just helping him we're living together it's a fun time everybody's growing he's figuring it out uh and then he takes it back to seattle you gotta move back to seattle and then he turns it into this monster like i don't like and i'm not surprised you guys haven't heard of it but like in its space they do so many numbers like he's paired up with people in oc now manufacturers and stuff like that yeah. uh the leverage uh oh. and then um so and and Rich he took it to like another stratosphere so, i'm so happy for so him. richie's probably like 24 14 to 20 launch 2015 yeah, yeah, like yeah. growing 2016 and okay. then uh guava juice guys i think that's around the same mm -hmm. wave three those uh, uh roy wasabi and um yeah mm -hmm. the wasabi roy, guys yep. and then um who else and then wave four i would say is uh i think that's when you start seeing a lot of like the foodie chef content totally that's and like I know he's not Asian, but like kind of that stage of cooking with Babish is like when he blows up. And then everybody that is like comes connected to that. 100%. And, uh, That's like squarely 2017 to 2019 yeah. probably. And then pandemic births a whole bunch of TikTokers. Oh, Viners kind of make their way back into YouTube and all this stuff. And then wave five, I think, is um, essentially the good Asians that are now becoming creators. So it's the bankers that are that are that are doing personal Funny. finance. Yeah. It's the it's the startup people. Mm. It's the J Hoovies. It's the it's you know it's all those folks that are like okay cool like. Oh, yeah, when I, you I, said good Asians, like the the people that were on the stereotypical path. I guess yeah, corporate. Right, right. Yeah, they're corporate Asians. Right. 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 But yeah. they were inspired by all the generations before. Yeah. And now they know how to make content. Right. Because they also specialize. So it's like. Uh, I follow Brian Shu, who's based out of New York. He's the stats guy. Yeah. This is it. He's like, mm. you've probably seen the video. Mm. And uh, he's from the corporate world. That's yeah. not his full time, but yeah. like, he's making an impact. I see that he's homie. A, I, I don't know. I forget his name, but he's like this tall, good looking cat. He does like real estate. Real estate yeah. And he sells all the like. Some of the Asian or what? He's, he's an Asian cat, like luxury uh, condos. I think he's and Korean. Joint. He shows yeah. like the. Uh, $13 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Korean Ryan Serhan. Yeah. Korean Ryan Serhan. Yeah. Yeah. Say word. Sorry. You know, Shout out to Ryan. <laughs> Shout out to Ryan, though. Uh oh, Jimmy Zhang. I don't know if you guys know him. He's from New York originally. He's like right. four, I want So, like, I would say, like, me, Chris Cho, Cafe Maddie, like, we are all pandemic babies. Like, yes. We started making content because of the pandemic um, during that time. So That's a whole generation. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, is that four or five? I would say I'd that's say five. five. I'd yeah. say five. Yeah, five. Five. And then maybe we're, we're starting to see six. Yes. Because you know these mean? are people who, after the pandemic, yeah. after you guys, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think six, 
and the Asian American. It'll be interesting to see where the Asian American. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Actually, yeah, they're all. There's so much Asian American. Uh, Way five, yeah. From like the families, you see that stuff on TikTok, like the family in Virginia, the family in Irvine, like the dad doing like the funny stuff or like sneak. I don't in. know where they're at, but yeah, I'm probably yes, yes. I've just come across right. It. So it's just like, I think it's a lot of the families and older folks that saw the stuff and the success and essentially the traction that you guys were getting that were like, cool, I'll yeah. do this. Yeah, those are the people. Everybody <laughs> from like wave four and up, they call us OGs. Yeah, that's they what I'm don't saying. know that I'm wave two. I'm like, trust me. Like, I, if I'm ten plus years in the game, there's people who are fifteen. Yeah, Tim, we started Tim, in 2009. Tim is Tim De La Ghetto Wang Fu. Fifteen years yep. in, yep. they're yeah. still going. Yep, you know David Choi. Yes, David <laughs> Choi. Yeah, he, he does apps now. He does so so, yeah. so yeah. different. So, um, but yeah, um, man, it's I think it's like what I'm seeing that I love. And there's like things that I love and don't love, right? Of like what I've seen, and I don't want to be this old cat that's like, you know, like Not the, be you know, the old, old cats, you know, the '70s basketball players, like they don't play like, yeah. But like, be the old cats, huh? talk. To I me. think you should be the old cat. You know, one of the things I want you to be. Should I embrace old... it? What's I think your suggestion. Bro, give me some. Can you consult me real quick? How old of a cat yeah. should I feel? I mean, so I'm literally older than you You're and young. actually part of the generation before, I think. You, you literally so, have like white so, hairs on your Yeah, I head, literally so. have white hairs and, and, you know, buy my clothes from Costco and, and you know, he's my rocking a Benjamin Moore hat. Yeah, like and not, I, he's not I'm, doing sarcastic. But that's kind of like saying. circular, right? That's no, like I know. This thing is now. like super yeah, hipster, yeah. but he, he didn't do it with yeah, that intention. Yeah, I, I literally, don't, like, I don't that's give a fuck. That's just suburban now. Yeah, I don't give a fuck is basically the point. But I think, I think one of the things I do is I really, really try to be. Um, just humble and dumb about like new shit coming up all the time, right? And I and you're you're like that too. I can I, I can already say like whether it's nine four nine, like I don't care. Like I just want to know. I'm obsessed with trying to figure out like okay, like what is it? Like yeah. oh what what kind of shoes are those? Oh like what do, what are you guys watching? And it could be a five year old. My my I have seven, four and a two year old. Like I I want to know what's going on, right? So whether a oh, ZHC by the way, right? ZHC like my my son was watching ZHC stuff. I don't know. He did, he's he's the Asian American cat that does like custom iPhone things. He's in he's he's managed by night. I think I know who you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, you're right. You're Again, right. my point is I'm always trying to pay attention, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm always trying to pay attention. That would be my first thing, which I think you already do. Second thing is like, yo, there there's like there's wisdom to be get, like there's a dope thing about getting older and just knowing more, right? So mm -hmm. when I want you to be old guy, and we have these conversations privately, I want to know about what you what your your TV deal. Because again, for us, being the old guy and rebuilding and riding way forward into what we're trying to do, I look at that shit. He's like, yo, should we do this? I'm like, fuck that. Like, they're literally only distribution, right? When we look at deals, we look at brand, audience, and revenue. I'm like, literally the only thing that they could provide right now is maybe prestige and distribution to a new place that we're not in right now. Production, probably. I mean, production, man. Production. Do, do I want? Mean. Do I want? We started before he, he got here. We were talking about the setup, right? iPhones and the, like. I don't want a second AC. I know what you mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do. showrunner, <laughs> yeah. producer, then a field producer. Da, 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 I mean, da, da, da. if anything, you know it is yeah, better the, than the, anybody. Did they fuck else. up what you All were right. doing? Yeah. So let's talk about the TV thing. Yeah. I don't. I, I personally don't want to spend too long. Be, not because I I hated the show, but yeah. because you guys didn't watch. Nobody watched it. But you can buy it on Amazon, all 13 episodes. <laughs> Broke Bites, What the Fung, not my finest work. But shout out to BSTV from Montclair, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, I still yeah. got love for them, but the show did not turn out. We're popping YouTubers at the time. So, of course, we're in control of everything. By popping, explain what popping means. We, we're hitting some million view videos okay. and our subscribers going up. Uh, we're in there, in the game, steadily in YouTube. And then we get this TV deal after doing some pilots. So we're like, well, we got to take it. You know, so we take it. And then what happens is you're familiar with TV or at least traditional media. See, it's called traditional media now, like a bygone era where you got mad cameras. The lights are huge. People got to bring in panels. And then these cameras are this big, literally, to shoot food. How do you shoot your food? Phone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah, they, yeah. The technology has changed so much. But also, like, the, they... I don't know, traditional media, they like big cameras. They like the big bazooka cameras, yeah. cameras, right? So we got bazooka cameras on set. We got huge lights. We got field producers. We got up top for this FYI network um, that uh, Amber Rose also had a show on, Tiny House Nation, Love at First Sight. 
And then, like, we're going to all these spots. It's basically diners, drive-ins, and dives going around America, except with two Asian guys. Right. Now, shout out to them for putting on two Asian guys. To my to this date, I think that's the most Asian hosted TV show in history, where a hundred percent of the hosts are are Asian. Right. Uh. So, and then we're going around all these different cities, and what I loved about the show is that I got to see America. I really got to go to places I I'm not gonna go on my own time. We go around to America. We go to Charleston, South Carolina, the, the Asheville, uh, North Carolina. We're going to. Tampa we're going to um, all over and we're filming but we got a showrunner a producer we got kind of someone that's like hey can you say this this brisket ramen in Denver cooked by this guy is like the best you've ever had and we're sitting there like Asian I ate sushi at a ramen just three weeks ago in LA and I'm like my brother's like no I'm not saying that I'm not oh, saying interesting. that and he's like I can't say it he's like I'm not and there becomes there is some tension because not that they're trying to feed us scripted lines, but there are things that they want us to say on the show, you know, that we're just not authentic. And we were YouTubers at the time. So we're like, let us be us. Right. Let us have this banter. Let us talk about all these little cultural things that we know about this food. And they're just like, uh, we're probably going to get cut out in the edit because we got to move fast because, you know, there's a schedule and you have to move the arc and then you're blah, 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 all this stuff. And we're just like, uh. so we just we finish it. Um, but we do, we probably don't play as nice in the post of the show as we could have. Like could have taken a few more meetings and stuff like that. So you know, so, apologies so, on that so, side. So but the, in terms of the actual production, you guys didn't enjoy that process. Nah, because the huge ass cameras. Even though the crew was cool, the right. crew they gave us like a really cool crew, very diverse. It was like Korean DP. We had like black and bar uh, Caribbean guys on from New York on the squad. So it was fun to hang out and stuff. But at the end of the day, what the show turned out to be, and if you watch the episodes and you watch us now, you're going to be like, okay, this is pretty different. Like TV wasn't our priority after that. You know, even if we did little guest stints on uh, this cooking show. It was like, like when Jen got the Rough Riders deal. Y'all thought that that was the thing, but the label wanted yeah, it to mold it to a certain angle. To think that if you get a TV show that's your dream right but it, but if i were to ever do it again i would do traditional media again but i'd have to have way more creative control right. absolutely right? right but this is a struggle with everybody i heard i was talking to uh some people who worked on the charlemagne show recently and it was a similar way like charlemagne is who he is but like even the show was like you got things you need a hit and like you know all that so it's not you never get to be as authentic you know and i'm not saying it would have blown up if you had let us be us but i don't think it would have made a difference and it would have been better for us we would have been happier but again talent actually in that sense and brian i'm sure you know talent in that sense is actually replaceable we're the replaceable part if it's not us they're going to put in some other maybe asian guy or guy or girl who can smile and deliver and bring in that charisma and talk to all these chefs but i think we just learned a lot from that show you know and it did make us appreciate youtube more yeah I mean, I think that's the biggest lesson that I wanted you to share is that like, not only the creative control part, but like, I, I think that those shows need, I think those shows are over. I think television, the same way, and I, by over, and we talked to like literally producers that yeah, produced. Our friend Helen, Helen, Helen show. She literally produced No Reservations. She literally produced yeah. uh, uh, Parts Unknown, right? She literally yeah. produced that, right? And then, and then Lisa Ling show and David Letterman's, uh, you know, so she produced big time TV or streaming, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and, and she also worked with us where, you know, she would have a month doing that. And then she had one day doing like us doing like a La Dinastia thing, right? Mm. Like it's crazy. So from a, from a how it actually works and how broken the actual production part of it is, right? To also just like, I love what you said about uh, being replaceable, the best shows that will work there are going to be shows where the creators that are going on come with a community where they can't be replaced. Right. So if you look at that kind of stuff, it's like um, like Pat McAfee, right? Pat McAfee is on ESPN. You know, outside of streaming rights and games, he's bigger than than Sports Center right now on ESPN. Well, well, Sports Center is having issues. They're they're yeah. downsizing. But like, yeah, 
that that's the world that we live in, right? Mm. And he and he was he was a football he was a kicker. You, do you know anything about Pat? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. But he's literally stuff. the most important person in 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 like sports commentary, right? Right. Now, right. Especially because again, he hit South. He hit South Carolina. Yep. But he but he also was just on all the smoke with you know. Yeah. Steven Jackson. Yeah, you have to have a super. If you're starting a network now, mm -hmm. like even a YouTube media, oh, I've had so many conversations with dudes that are like, yo, I want to start an Asian network. I want to start an Asian network. You have to have some f existing faces attached to it to bring people in. That's how any of these networks start, like even Daily Wire, you know, whatever. Like they have to have faces that are drawing in people. Mm -hmm. You know? So I want to ask you a question about that. So Asian Network, right? So our first conversation started. Well, I've known him before, but I wanted to make it. Everybody Asian, here at this table has had multiple conversations I, about yeah, the Asian, dream. Asian well, tell podcast. Him what I said. Yeah, so I hit him with this idea. It was like 2020. My TikTok had just started to pick up, but I had this idea of starting an Asian podcast network, right? Because... You know, like not only was it a passion thing, but it was from a business angle. I thought, okay, yo, here's a TAM, like an addressable market that is not being touched upon right now with authority. I hit him with the idea and he's like, yo, son, that shit is a dumb idea. That shit is in the eighth inning in terms of baseball terminology. So the, That's ga hilarious. So the game is about to be over. It's a really good so analogy. I think you should just index into doing TikTok instead of talking about no Asian podcast network and all that. And literally like seven months later, Bill Simmons got a deal. Joe Rogan got a big deal. Even they cut a check to Kim Kardashian. You know, Spotify uh -huh. was just everybody cutting checks for everybody. So I was like, oh shit, he was right. You know what I mean? Like, so I, you know, you've mentioned. I'm sure people entertain that idea to you guys as well. And we've entered, and and we still, I think it can work, in a way, but it's it's not what we all think it is. But I'm also curious, like, why do we need it? And also, if we were to do it, what would that even look like? I think Asians are too different from each other. Exactly. Yeah. We're not a monolith. I know we always say that we're not a monolith. We're not a monolith. <laughs> we're not all. Not everybody's Chinese. I get it. Yeah. It's not going to work in the way that we all think. Like where I see network. I know there's actually Asian entertainment networks that are getting funded right now. And I don't think they're going to last. And it's not because I don't want them to, but because they're trying to do too much it's gonna be more of a niche. Like you're focusing on Asian women, Asian men, Asian LGBT, what, like those are niches to me that make sense. But just this whole extra like, yo, um, like in a way the inclusion of everybody, it is gonna be tough to get anybody. And I think that's, and I use restaurants as an example. You ever go to a fusion restaurant that's like serving, got like, oh, well, this is a Korean version of a Filipino dish with Thai and Chinese influences. Those restaurants never expand very far unless they're for the non-Asians like uh, Wagamama. That's actually from, I want to say Britain, England. Yeah. From England, yeah. But that's not considered in the culinary world. Like we don't like, we don't really mess with that. Like I'm not saying the food is terrible, but we just don't mess with it. Like it's not authentic, but being still that one ethnicities of food with a little twist is really what's working. All the new fusion Korean restaurants in New York City, like they're Korean, like that should be, it should, Korean plus other influences, mm -hmm. you know, Chinese plus other, plus like it. So I think that's part of the issue is that to be honest, Asians are so vast. And I think that we ha just have to acknowledge that. Like, I don't think there's an issue. Like I got friends of all different types, but I think that there's slightly different things that appeal to them. You know, so I think that um, it's hard to appeal to even all Asians. Yeah, definitely. And it to make sense. For sure. And, and there's also, not to throw in, not to even mention, there's the the motherland hierarchy. We all know hierarchy yeah, of Asia. Caste system, this, colorism. Whatever it is that ranks people for whatever reason, country of origin, motherland of origin, um, there's all those separations, you know? Yeah. But, and not to toot our own horn, I feel like we always did a pretty good job of delving into and exploring and showing everybody love and showing all the different niches love down to the different tribes, different types of, even the ones Hmong men, like the people with who don't have a, 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 nation, a nation, you know, yeah. like, and, um, the, uh, and just delving into stories and like being 
of the earlier stage of people who did that, I do take some pride. I take pride in that because I think like I have people who still come up to me like, oh, man, you told him like, thank you for doing that chill jow video because like I didn't know my background was chill jow. And then like I talked to my parents and I learned all this stuff and I was like, that's cool. That's yeah. awesome. That's like what we wanted, you know. Yeah. Um, but doing all that also reminded me, I was like, damn, Asians are diverse. Yeah. We're not going to vote the same. We're not going to think the same. We don't all look the same. And even though there are th certain things that unite us, like largely, there's a lot that doesn't. Yeah. The idea of like seeing no representation or people that look like us, mm -hmm. you know, playing sports or, or in music, like the shit that I cared about, or, you know, even in corporate America, shit I cared about, like it mattered, right? It definitely mattered. But now to my kids, they're growing up in a world where like Shoei Itani is the best black, pl baseball player, right? Of like, all time, probably. Yeah, yeah, of all time, right? They're, they're growing up in a time where like, you know, they listen to Bad Bunny and Blackpink. And at the same time, and at they the same time, and they the think it's time. completely yeah, normal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or like that is not normal yeah. to a <laughs> twenty-five and up year old. Or or Peso Pluma being number one, a Mexican uh, artist being global number one for like three weeks, right? Amazing. Right, right after Miley Cyrus's "Flowers." Like my, that's the my kids know those songs like that. Oh. That's the world that they live in. They know New Jeans. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, global sure. market. Yeah, so like, so in that global market, for us to try to prop up and really advocate for something that you can't even prop up as a monolith oh it's not a monolith it, it, it's like i think we're addressing the wrong problem yeah i mean it's an antiquated uh, mindset yeah. yeah i don't i guess i don't disagree i think that there is still a desire for it though. i i want to put on wax i i definitely think that we should talk about it but i think to try to do it if, if anything, we're more empowered now to do it with nuance and it doesn't have to try to appeal to everybody. So I agree with your point. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with your point. But I think I think the the same networks have talked to us about doing content. The same networks, I like, they were talking in 2012 when they were launching linear channels, linear cable channels. Like, it's a thing. It's, you know, this idea of like multicultural marketing agencies and like all this kind of stuff, all that stuff I'm saying is going to start to go away. Because that used to be a way that you no, could, don't say uh, that. To uh, that. No, 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 no. Yeah, that. but I mean, I, I think um, I know what you mean. Yeah, because it's 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 all general market, right? Yeah. And I think it's it's all general market because we live in a place where everyone's exposed to everything. Now, having said that, there still needs to be yes, you know, there still needs to be there. There will be multicultural marketing agencies because they're still going to help to hit people on like cable TV, right? Yeah. There's still going to be like, you know, there's still going to be that. But I, again, the future generations, my kids, they're not going to, it's going to be a completely different thing. Even Jakey's experience is different from mine yeah. living in New York, right? So I, and I grew up in LA, but the trope of like, you take, you take a, you know, a lunch to, to school and they're like, oh, what are you eating? Eh, right? My kids, and it started with him. He's like, oh, you don't know about this? Man, you you uncultured. You know what I'm saying? In New that York, still happens in parts of America, though. Yeah, no, I, think, no, I definitely enough. have the New York Queens privilege, yeah. Yeah. where I could like literally like beat up a white kid. No, for, you get to be trying, alpha about yeah, who you are. Exactly. For, for, for You're like, you don't know about sushi. Like, yeah. You don't know about kimchi. Like, I'll fuck you, you up. Yeah, you know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like that yeah. was the norm exactly. from where we were yeah. grew up in. But maybe that's the microcosm of. I'm not saying that I, I don't want to ever say that you physically hurt anybody ever, but it's just I think that's just a microcosm of what we could see moving forward. Well, so, um, like in a, in a world where Z100 has an entire two hour K pop slot, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. this is primetime New York radio playing pop music. Yeah. So, uh, yo, I grew up in New York my whole life, I never would have imagined that. Like, the hottest new R&B singer, she's South African. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like, I, I don't think, like, the hottest new basketball player is a French kid. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think I would have ever imagined that happening in my lifetime, but I'm happy that it's happening. Yeah. So Why maybe the focus shouldn't be how can we figure out a monolithic Asian channel, EST, 88 rising. You know, like, it's more so like, yo, how Are can we... Are you calling those monolithic? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think oh. their angle, that's how they pitch themselves if they actually that's go into a meeting. That's literally how they meeting. raise money. They raise money on... I saw the 88 out. rising deck. Oh, wait, wait, what do you mean? You know what I mean? Oh, uh, but they incorporate, I guess, no, that's... that's the way they raise money to white people is like, yo, 
we're going after Asians. And you know what? They like literally they're like, yo, we're going after the entire Chinese market. But I was like, yo, you're having an English platform. What does that even mean? <laughs> like Chinese people don't speak English. You know, what uh, I mean? you know what's funny is that and I think I want to give a lot of credit to the consumers nowadays because like if you say you're one thing, I think it used to feel like if I said I was Chinese and vocally spoke about it, that means 80% of my fans are going to be Chinese right off the bat, mm. to be honest. Like, but I think nowadays it's changing where even if you say, oh, I'm Korean, I'm Chinese, whatever, it doesn't turn off other no. people as much as long as you do not violate them. Right. As long as you don't disrespect, as long as it shows that you show respect to their culture as, as I want to show respect to Korean culture, Filipino culture, Vietnamese culture, show a lot of love to Viet culture and uh, obviously Chinese culture. But like, I think as long as people feel respected, yeah. they'll rock with it. Like, so if you go to 88 stage at Coachella or whatever, like I went one year and, or any of the, any of the, the uh, head in the clouds concerts, it's like, there is different types of people. There is obviously a bunch of Asians who you could say, uh, they look like they might know each other, but like, there's a lot of still different types of people. And I think that, even though they're proudly Asian and a lot of their artists are from Asia and like literally international school in Asia and that's why they're so good at English. It's like, you're not turning off other people as much by saying who you are. Yeah. And I think it's important to say who you are. It's okay. 100%. Which, I just, there was I, comedians, I know Asian comedians back in the day that literally would not tell people whether they were Chinese or Korean because they thought it was gonna split them, which at that time, maybe there was more truth to it. Right. To, to be honest, yeah. nowadays, less so. If you can represent everybody and people can feel it, I think it's more yeah, I mean, more open. Yeah, People, people more in my sure. comments, I, less I would say now. majority of them are non-Asians. Mm -hmm. When I talk about the things that Asian parents do and I get an Asian mom to go act it out, it hits so visceral and actually a whole bunch of non-Asians, mm. other immigrant kids can relate to it. That's a, that's a very good point because yeah. sometimes the most, the more niche it is, is the most global. And I think that's where we're going yeah. is what I mean, yeah. is that this is the world where as long as I'm- Authentic to I'm yourself. willing to, I can acknowledge all the other groups of people, but I do I just have to speak it from my own experience. But right. if you relate to it, great. And I never want to- yeah, you know, I, I feel it. you. My my favorite Instagram channel was Fools Gone Wild, man. I don't know anything That's about hilarious. like cholo Mexican high socks culture. Yo, but side story. I love that. I love that channel with my heart. You know, what this mean? person from Brooklyn a few several years ago. I don't think she had been to L.A. yet, but she asked me. She goes, "Yo, are the cholos really like that out in L.A.? Is that real?" <laughs> mm. And I was like, "Yeah, they got lowriders. I seen them in Pasadena. <laughs> yeah, they're they're out there. You know." So I think. Um, just with the global internet now and people being exposed to everything, it's like. Totally. Yeah, still talk about your own experience, still be you and that's you. But as long as you're not, you know, and you're open to everybody and it's legit and people can feel that vibe, I think it's great, you know? Yeah. So I think that to compliment 88 is what I'm saying because of what they're doing, you know, they created cool products or a product that a lot of people think is cool. And then now it appeals to more different types of people. And those types of people don't have to be, like if you're a, a black kid who listens to ADA, you don't have to be constantly like feel like, oh, this is like different or a white kid who listens to Oh, totally. Well, you know? I think when I look at 88, I'm like, I look at Joji and people don't listen to him because he's Asian. People listen to him because he's like Brooklyn hipster music. He got, he got his own thing. Yeah, that's why. Thing. He's that's unique. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, so yeah. like, and, th and they'll listen to like, you know phoebe bridges like you know what i'm saying it's right. that right with that said yeah. i know a lot of asian kids who say their favorite rapper is rich brian and i'm like <laughs> hey no shout out to, uh, yeah but yeah if that's you're obviously of a certain age if that is your yeah. your top rapper, right 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 know? hey sure. so um, but he's good yeah what do you uh, tell us how you spend your day today like uh, yeah what, what are yeah, you working actually on what, what, yeah. what does your week look like okay. as a as a so we're now, content we're, creator so of we a jump decade in, plus ex experience the, the micro day to day yeah, yeah. well it's a good time i'll talk about what we're working on so we just did a comedy show at sour mouse we sell out 75 seats every congratulations every month man. and it's fun it's uh i get to bring on and meet a lot of different comedians and Ronnie Chang stopped by, did a guest spot last year to kind of end off the year. It's been very gratifying to perform in front of people. Mm. And I love it because it's a different connection than online. I don't want to say I will, I will always do YouTube because I think YouTube reaches the most number of people. 
and you can create, create content and do all that stuff. But something about doing live, I'm like, once a month, this is like a treat for me, you know? You kind of get to say different things, you know? I say a bunch of stuff there that I don't say on YouTube. And I wouldn't say on this podcast. Because it's like when you enter that room, there's an invisible contract you sign that say, hey, this is a comedy show. Comedy, it's meant to be taken lightly. Don't take it too harsh, even if you're slightly offended. It is a comedy show. So people are going to push the limits a little bit more. YouTube, I don't believe that that's the right place. Podcast is why so many people get canceled off their podcast because they're just letting their brain flow and they're just like, this is a safe space. I'm just going to say whatever. You have to understand people listening are like listening by themselves mm -hmm. at home and they're just like, they're feeling that type of way. They don't have another person to talk to. When you're at a comedy show, you look around, everybody's laughing. Oh, shit. All right. Well, I don't want to. Even if you're getting roasted, you're like, ah, this is just part of the, you know. So, anyways, that's why I love comedy always. Um, and I'll try to do it on some level. But, we just did that, but in the meantime, essentially, YouTube channels, we're making changes to the YouTube channel, and then working on Smala Sauce, which is our new chili oil, which is currently sold out from the first batch, but uh, um, we're working on the second batch right now. Word. And it's, Congrats, uh, man. It's a hot chili oil, we're trying to bring like mala, like that numbing spice to the mm. masses. Yeah. And, uh, Are we a lot gonna of people try like it. it with the pizza? We're gonna try it with yeah, the pizza. Yeah, you know, yeah, you cool. can try it right here yeah, off the, yeah. Yeah. do a dab but um yeah we'll do it on the pizza and this is a sample bottle this is not how the actual bottle works, okay but, okay uh, but i had to do this for an event so doing that that's a new venture that i think is really cool that has opened up a whole new world of consumer packaged goods the nectar world like following jeremy and the all oh, wind coffees uh, everybody i'm curious like, you guys must have had multiple opportunities to delve into cpg in the past especially when you guys were heavily indexing on food content what was what like, kind of took so long to well be i guess like yeah like we did you guys have like a big merch business like i never love we sold some boba life t-shirts back in the day right. which was kind of like boba life. no we kind of narrow it <laughs> no we kind of narrowed it narrowed ties what's the like word herbal life we oh we God, narrated man. that rise of boba uh, because yeah, it's yeah. a cultural no shit. i know yeah no it's significant there's articles that quote yeah y'all like y'all like the y'all like, like, like the mascots of Boba culture, man. Kind, uh, Boba. You know right. what I mean? I, what so you guys, did you guys? I don't want to say you have a, You guys should have a piece of Boba guys. I'm a, did you invest? No. I love, I love those guys. It, it, um, but uh, when I think Boba, I, I wish I got a piece man. of that. No, no, that's good. That's fine. I don't want to. I don't consider myself a champion of Boba, but we told the story. And it just felt like we were the champions of it. But because... It's not because of the product itself, even in my opinion. It's about what it means culturally. And, right, right. And and me and my brother David, we we saw that early on, you know. And and Dave was like, "Yo, man, like this boba life culture out in San Gabriel Valley is like, yo, we got to talk because we're we're newcomers to San Gabriel Valley, and we made we made that home for several years. Anyways, as far as the CPG, yeah, it did take us a while to kind of delve in, uh, dip into this, but I never really wanted to. I never really liked selling T-shirts as much. You know, we sold some, but like, I didn't want to sell people clothes that they didn't need or that I didn't feel like was actually good, mm, really good. I respect that. Yeah. Um, so it, we just could never really feel passionate about it. And then recently, uh, a few years, a couple years ago, I get in touch with this agency called uh, Create with Kira and, and I hit them up because they help people launch brands. Right. And now this is the space that we're at in 2024. Mm. There's agencies and companies and you can make money helping all these creators and influencers create their brands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember yeah. white Rodeo. label companies? That do you remember Rodeo Arcade? I I had that program. I built that for Maker. Rodeo Arcade. Rodeo Arcade. Uh, so basically my job at Maker when they acquired my company was essentially run music, but also run and build any business outside of advertising. So but remember for the Maker or for artists? For at Maker. So we had PewDiePie games. We had right. PewDiePie t-shirt. We had right, right, Yogg's right. Cast posters. Right. Do you think that, would you say that that was successful or maybe it was a little before its time? It was way before its time. A $10 million business was a nice to have when you're getting you know, 50 million from CPG brands, right? Like it, it's, it was literally a nice to have, but today it's not a nice to have, it's the thing, right? You gotta. If you have, if you have community, you could pour them into anything, right? Yeah. 
So, you know, we're on wax saying this. Go back. We, we, I've been saying there's going to be a Mr. Beast fucking mortgage and, and, and insurance like years ago, right? People yeah. don't understand that. Everything that you think is protected by moat, technology is mm -hmm. deflationary, right? Technology is deflationary. So when you look at uh, Procter & Gamble and you're like, okay, well, they're just going to buy the next – or you look at Mars. They're just going to buy Feastables. Why? Why would Feastables sell to them? Cash, right? Capital. Capital is a commodity now. Banks, lenders. Capital easy to get capital easy in a way. Get, yeah, easy to get capital, right? Okay, well, distribution, shelf space. Dude, real creators, if you're a real creator, you will go to certain stores to buy certain things on certain shelves. I mean, that's what's happening in Walmart right now with Feastables. Right? Yeah, yeah, it happened, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what's happening with uh, Jeremy and Nectar. And, yeah. and by the way, the only thing that ends up happening after that is then then you get to a certain point where you have enough clout and now you get the end cap, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then again, I saw that shit 10 years ago with t-shirts and posters and merch mm -hmm. and, and uh, affiliate deals and all that stuff. Again, I'm zooming out again to be like, yo, I think Vivian, we're on record saying this too. We think you're, you're rich BFF, probably mm -hmm. fifth wave Asian, Asian American. Yeah. And she's not really even only appealing to that. I think Vivian is Kathy Wood of ARK Invest, right? Because I think people that watch her are not her subscribers, but I think they're, they're, they're her LPs, right? I think Cody Sanchez, I'm on record saying this, I think Cody Sanchez is the next Blackstone because right now she's talking about bored, you know, boring businesses that are laundromats and car washes and et cetera. Mm. But again, yo, you consolidate enough of those, which private equity is doing right now. Yo, you're, you're going to start to rival Blackstone, right? Zoom out. 10 years, 20 years. That's sort of where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Get, get us next. Yeah. Who, who, are, who are we the next? Think of that. I, I like this, Brian. You go, 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 go. Well, I mean, I, I who think. Who are fun bros? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Are you Andrew Schultz? Tell, tell me about Are you Andrew Schultz? Uh, how, are, how are you going to leverage YouTube to what you're doing right now? How yeah. much of your existing audience is, how much of your existing audience is still from before? How much of it is new, right? I, I you know. I actually think we're capturing, I don't want to say, but. I feel like our recent boost in exposure is gonna, I mean, it helps Smala and it helps everything that we're doing. It's like, I feel like we're kind of getting like a little bit of a small little wee, like a little now. Like an uptick? So people you know, know you for that. Because what happened is we have how I view it and tell me if, uh, what your view of this is. Fung Bros, Fung Brothers, from back in the day, from whatever, whenever you watched a video, which a lot of people stopped watching, you know the brand name, you've heard of it, and you've seen something from mm -hmm. us over the years. We put out so much content, we've been around. But, and we made so many different types of videos. Right. Sneakers, food, Asian videos, travel videos, literally every, everything. And then, so, a lot of people kind of like forgot about us or whatever, or stopped watching. And then now with, Hopefully what I hope, part of what I hope that my comedy clips do and Smala Sauce, it brings a little bit like renewed eyeballs and be like, oh, oh, this is by the Fung Bros? Oh, shoot. Like, you know what? Like, I'm, I don't watch their videos anymore. I don't have time or maybe I'm not as interested or whatever. But, you know, I'll check out their sauce. Oh, their sauce is good. Oh, great. And then boom. And then it's like this re-ignition refresh i don't know whatever mm. word it is but like that's how i kind of view what's happening okay i guess but because what's the what's the utility though what's the thing no well, i mean you know so if i'm still following you and watching you what am i going to get from you like what's my value so if i was a 12 year old kid that lived in kansas and you were you were empowering me to be proud of being asian when i when i'm surrounded by all these white kids or you know i you, you were the one that Help me to say like, oh shit, sneaker culture is a thing. Like, oh mm -hmm. fuck, I can make mm -hmm. money. Yeah. There's 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 history there. It's cool. Like I, you know, you you help me be, you help me give a, a sense of identity to to me in my junior high or high school. Like you were all those things for, and then in food, and then all these different things. Right? What's your utility that you're giving now to your new audience or existing? Oh, you mean like this? I guess well, the sauce is well, utility. whatever it might be. Right? Yeah. So this, but even that that utility. Why do people care when you're competing against like Fly by Jing yeah, or yeah, yeah. The, the, there was a Mala one that we got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we part, that, part yeah, yeah. of why I think yeah. some people bought the first batch, part of it was just to support. Yeah, right. totally. They're curious, too, though. Totally. I don't think they hate chili oil. Yeah, they're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I could use one. Fung yeah. Bros got one. Let's check it out. I yeah. generally, you know, I generally view the Fung Bros as thoughtful people. Maybe they put thought Super into this. Super thoughtful, yeah. So, so maybe it's good. Yeah. I think it was better than a lot of people thought, to be yeah. honest. It is, yeah. Yeah. it is good. But, like, 
By I, the way, yeah. Okay, continue. Is that does that answer your question? Or? I think so. One of the biggest things that was different from what we used to do, and and when we were doing the same thing, uh -huh. and what we're doing now is, if I'm being very candid about it, back then on YouTube, it was big enough just to be a uh, early mover, right? Like if you were yeah. an early mover, if you were just making, yeah, videos, if you were just you're making, gonna videos, get something. You're out gonna of get it. something. Whether I'm watching your vlog or I'm watching like early stages of programming, like whatever it might be, whatever vertical, right? It was like cool, like oh, you're doing this in this vertical, like you were, you were, like that was enough. Today, when Korean parents watch, they don't watch TV, but they watch YouTube. Today, when like YouTube is literally, you know, streaming the Super Bowl and you know Major League Baseball, we live in a world where. Like you're constantly vying for attention. So the nowadays for anyone making content, not just YouTubers, for anyone making content, that value proposition has to be super clear. And that, that exchange has to be super well, clear. Well, it's harder to catch your eyeball. Yeah. So yeah. like whether I'm watching some like a, like someone that's hot and attractive or someone that's super that's funny. That's why, yeah. Some or, of them or, that sometimes yeah, are just hot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or, or sometimes they're telling you financial advice that you think is useful. 100%. Yeah, so it's now like it's, a clear utility. Yeah. Like, what are you giving me? Yeah. 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 But oh. back in the day, it used to just be like, yo, I'm watching Fun Bros, oh. right? But oh. now it's like, oh, I'm watching Fun Bros and they're going to literally oh. show me how they're going to take a... Uh, an underserved product that most of the world doesn't know about and they're going through that. That's what Jeremy's doing with Yeah, with, that's with what Nectar, he's doing right? with Nectar. Yeah. And now he's like, look, hey, you want to know how uh, about DMAs? This is how these uh, marketing areas are. Dude, w you know. Yeah, he's explaining the game. Yeah, spirits are a completely different thing. Oh, uh, Superline super super line line super line Warehouse. Line of work industries, yeah. Yeah, in, in Atlanta. Like a Korean cat who's doing like, so wholesale doing blanks and shit. All the Korean Jabba, Asian Jabba business that our parents used to do, they're just doing that now. They're selling blanks. But explaining it. But they're explaining it. Yeah. That shit. And they're, they're going they're, to trade shows, asking <laughs> a Chinese vendor, yo, like, you made this for Kith? Okay, how much would it cost for me to make it if I work with you? And the vendor's like, oh, the $20. The process is the content. Yeah, the process is the content, yes. Yeah. But so, the old school version of that, that is like, you ask Jeff, Bobby, any of these guys, how do you make that? Don't, don't, don't worry about it, you know? But now it's like, you have to give that game away. Well, you don't have to, but it's one way to do it, I would if say. You wanna, if you want to, if you want to cultivate a community, it is. I think yeah. I, the the most success that we've had is through just absolute. Obviously, there's NDAs and there's certain things that you just can't legally share. Yeah. But the more transparent it is, yeah. Um, I, I noticed that that's usually what it, drives. It's the kind needle. of the podcast. It goes along with podcasting. How podcasting dial, delves deep into these things and these conversations that. You know, usually, because content is always curated. It's just whatever you chose to put out. It's 100%. the time, the thing you edited, and you have to decide, like, is this worth putting out? Because I can't put out everything. But yes, the process being content, I think, is a cool, it's a cool thing. It's a cool aspect. Yeah. I like it. I think that it all comes down to, yeah, I mean, even that, I could make more content. I'm not afraid to tell people how small I started. I mean, a part of me doesn't feel like it's a successful enough to talk about it, but maybe I should be. But either way... But if anything, I think the journey, the fact that... So the whole story, right, of how you guys had a, a wave being uh, Gen 2 YouTubers. Now, you admittedly said, yo, the traction that we had before isn't quite there as much. The eyeballs. So, I mean, so eyeballs so, are being shared. So, yeah. so the fact that if you could share all of that is like, guys, this is our story, and then now we're investing all of our time, or well, at that, least a chunk of our energy into building this Mala brand. I think, like, if I'm a viewer, I'll be invested in that story, and then the mm. investment and the time that I invest in that story will make me more of a believer mm. and a follower. That want to support well, more the engaging. Mala business. You're saying that's another yeah, engagement. because I mean, because stories yeah, I need with. stories for me to buy yeah, into yeah. it because, like he said, like I could just go use fly by Jing, or I could just use sriracha, like I could just go to my Chinese uncle and basically get some like a variation of la gama. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, why no, do I need sure. to buy the Fung Bros hot hot, hot chili oil, right? Yeah. So, because because the product variation in, in that category is like you can't really tell the difference, right? No, you're right. So, there's a, I mean, there's the a lot story, of crisps out there. But the story is what's really going to make me feel invested. And, yeah, and I want right. to I want to make a point that I it's agree. not just this isn't a thing about your case in particular. I think that everything is going to become commoditized. So you know what I, you know what I mean? Like where you live, you know. I can buy this water or this water. You're already starting to see it. I go to energy. I go. I go to a store. I could buy Gatorade or I could buy Prime. Well, I 
I know Logan, so I'm gonna buy Prime. Like this is this is gonna happen, right? And so now, if you look at Logan, or if you look at any, before it was like, oh, they they were known because they were making it and they were early movers. But then if you don't follow the journey where you know Disney Channel to to pranks and vlogs to now he's a professional athlete to now he's talking about business and having people like Mark Cuban on to like there has to be that evolution right I think what I'm getting from what I realize is that that process becoming content that we're talking about it's actually very it's actually even more personal because what happens is everything's more personal now. podcasts are personal 100%. that's what I mean like yeah. everybody wants to hear like you said a story your story yeah why is this story going to capture people, right? I, even if you come from your parents started this t-shirt making factory in Atlanta, right? Whatever we're talking about. Him getting personal and talking about his story only is better for business. But it's funny because I think at a time being personal meant you had to talk about your personal life mm. and these things. But now personal means, okay, maybe you don't have to delve into your emotions as deeply Oh, like, who am I dating? Oh, my gosh. You know, people love breakup videos. They love to see the new girlfriend, boyfriend of some influencer, right? We never did that. It's like, in a weird way, we never really made that personal of content. So that's why, if anything, we're just a little, I don't want to say slower to this, but like, maybe I haven't even delved as personal as I could be. But my personal, personal There's a mentality is, shift too, though. Yeah, yeah but I'm starting to see, and we are getting a little more personal. Even doing comedy is, is definitely more personal if you, if you, you know, um, the stories that, I tell on stage are going to be even more raw and personal than the things I put on YouTube. Like I said, it's because part of it is just like a censorship thing, you know, but uh, I was like, can I actually dive on that? So I actually think that comedians, if you real comedians that have a real community, you can't get canceled. I think today in, in today's, Oh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm saying yeah. cancelable stuff, but even just edgy no, stuff. Yeah. No, but I'm saying like if online too, by the way, I, yeah, Shane Gillis came back. Yeah. Well, I'm saying like everybody in, in, in the sense that like now is a time where people want people in your community want you to stand for something. The days of like and, and this is a Chappelle thing, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you're right. This is a Chappelle I thing agree. like where, yo, I don't want Lululemon to talk to me about fucking inclusivity and that yo, you you <laughs> that shit was you you are a motherfucking like make my make my make my girl's ass look good or give me the most per, high high performing shit. I think that was Chris it, Rock. Chris Rock, well, sorry, right, Chris right, Rock. Right, right. One of the goats, right? Yeah. But like, yeah, uh, selective outrage. Yeah, oh, selective right? that was his outrage, later one, right? Yeah. But but the thing is, uh, to to use Chappelle, he's the one that would that had those comments about uh, the the trans, right? Yeah, LGBT. Right? Yeah. yeah, LGBT, right? And, and that he, was a huge. That was like took took up two and a half of his and, specials, and he did it on purpose, right? And what my point is, you're actually seeing a purge. You're seeing a purge for for people saying like, "Yo, I actually, if you fuck with me, this is what I stand for," and that actually makes people double down and follow you, follow you, or that it purges folks that were only there because they 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 caught you. You know, uh, so. this is a question yeah. I have. Go I ahead. agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it is somewhat political. I think it's connected to the political zeitgeist. So it's not just standing for something. I think the guys who have seen the biggest wave are actually standing for uh it's a rejection of what people thought the mainstream narrative was moving 100%. Anytime you can rebel against the narrative whatever it was when rock stars came out, rappers came out. Now rap is kind of at this point where it's been around for decades and I mean, are you listening to the new young rappers? I don't know. I'm not as I much into to. it. I, I try, try to. I keep yeah, up, yeah. but I'm not. Yeah, I try to. Yeah, I see. Personally, your point. I'm not into it. I see your point. Yeah. So, but but everybody, anytime you reject the mainstream, and I think there's that swinging pendulum. I'm talking about from a political standpoint. Just because it's our videos right though. now on on hot on hot pot boys are where we we do talk about kind of politics a little bit. People want to see a renegade. That's a not just a renegade for for being a renegade. But they want to see the heart of them and they want to see that you understand it, that you're standing for something but they ultimately like that renegade do, do you know, it, but it's not just politics do you know i think it's even more macro than that you got to zoom out further have you read the fourth turning no, if you if you haven't no. you're gonna love it is that a book it's a book it's we're a talking book about books brian yeah we're talking about books what generation are you from? or um 
or even Ray Dalio's pages. No, Ray Dalio's world changing the world. Yeah, I, I, th- th- I that's I what that. this is, right? We're essentially going through a different cycle, yeah. and the incumbency and the legacy. They just don't. Know I watched it. the YouTube video of Ray Dalio, by the way. Yeah, and so then exactly. Watch, yeah, exactly. Ray Dalio and, and guess what? On YouTube videos. Don't you don't even have to read the book Fourth Turning. Go watch Van Neistat, Casey's brother's version of the Fourth Turning, and it'll be just, just as good. Go, I'll YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it, it's it's okay. It's exactly what you're talking about, right? And I think the um, the point is that like I think we go through cycles of consolidation and cycles of dis- basically things being separated and, and, and breaking apart. Mm. I think we went through this massive wave of things being pulled together, globalization, all these things sort of like, you know, Lululemon being inclusive and like all everyone standing for everything. Mm-hmm. And now we're going through a place where we're like, no. And this is definitely political it's a contraction and expansion Absolutely. And all, yeah. yeah yeah and now we're going through a place where things are being pulled apart and technology has a big part to do with things being pulled apart because today it's easier it's easier today to be like look if i only like this thing then i could be a part of that if community. i only like this viewpoint yeah, 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 yeah. that's all you can yeah, see yeah. Exactly. i mean look at the, the way algorithm. that the algorithm yeah. controls itself, the algorithm you know? feeds you exactly so during you like are. the anti-asian hate uh situation that my algo wasn't feeding the same thing that was feeding some of my friends' algo, because some of my friends were getting fed constantly thank you, content about elders getting right. beat up. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, statistics saying that you know agents have it worse. You know, like all the content mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. was surrounding that narrative was mm-hmm. constantly being fed to them. Right. I mean, I see something similar happening right now with anti-semitism sentiment you know like we had a friend who just recently joined us chopping it up telling us that his mom's algo was just getting fed with nothing but anti-semitism content yeah yeah yeah. whereas him also a jewish and that's rough on the older people man that are not native isn't hitting hitting that same you know content will there's an extent to it being divisive but i think maybe everybody says that about every upcoming generation well like what i say about tiktok is what people said about youtube Totally. Right. Same thing. Oh, who are these kids making YouTube totally. videos? They don't know totally. about directing. I had I knew Asian directors and when I came to LA that were like talking so much trash about YouTube. And not and you know, not in a personal way, but Same just be shit. like, man, it's not good work. Yeah, I feel you on that. No, no, and, uh, hey, it's just YouTube. All those YouTubers? Exactly. <laughs> YouTuber comedians. They're not real comedians. You know, yeah. You know, so the funny thing is. I mean, we're obviously involved in a lot of projects, but one of my favorite things, and I know, I think it's one of JK's favorite things, is when people ask, especially in New York, they're like, hey, so what do you do? Like, it was, you know, like, oh. I mean, ask you. Yeah, yeah, like when we go to, like, a, I go to my kid's, like, open house. Right, so how I go do you to, sum up what you do? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. even, like, we were at this KKR Asian. Um, yeah, we're at KKR. By the way, guys, we're not using forks and knives to actually eat the pizza. No, 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 just, just, just to split, split it up. Yeah, yeah, because we have so many different yeah. flavors. So I like, got you. I want to try no, I just wanted to tell people that. <laughs> I want to try the hot sauce. Oh, before. yeah, we're valid. So we went to uh, this KKR gathering, and. Me and Brian are like the only guys in like hats and sneakers, right? Cause sure, please. It's like, please. I mean, I was definitely the only guy right, with, you're with, a, with, a, with a purple cardigan, you know? So, yes. you know pe- how to stand out. Pe- people I were, don't know if people that's a were always, technique, but, people were, were just asking us, like, okay, you guys don't, you guys don't have like a business casual suit on for this like mixer at a financial institution. Like, right, right, what do you guys right. do? And we just straight up tell these people that we're TikTokers. You know it's the I mean? easiest way to put it. Yeah, it's just the easiest way to put it. Because they under they kind of understand. They kind of get like, it. Oh my kid! Like, my oh kid. yeah, or like oh you guys. My kid make, wants to be a TikToker. Can you, you guys give make YouTube advice? videos? Yeah. So, <laughs> and I'm totally fine with that. You know, and I think right now, being a YouTuber, even my mom understands what being a YouTuber means as an occupation now. You know what I mean? Right. So, and you guys were at the forefront of it, which I applaud you and commend y'all for that. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, I mean, there was even people who came before us and inspired us, so I gotta always shout them out. Two questions: what keep, what keeps you up at night? Like, what are the things you're thinking about when you're not, you know, making stuff? I have been thinking more about the long term. I think that six years ago, people would ask us, "Hey, do you think you're gonna do YouTube forever?" Like, literally seven years ago, this is when we're like popping on YouTube, and they're like. What are you going to do after YouTube? I was like, guys, we just got this shit popping. What are you talking? Why would I think about 10 years from now, like, and what I'm going to do without YouTube? First of all, I'd always tell him, and me and David would always talk to people and be like, what makes you say we can't do YouTube in 10 years? Yeah. Yo, talk that. We're seven years in. We're still doing it. It doesn't, 
why does it why is youtube something that you have to retire from why is content now something you look at gary v mm -hmm. is gary v retiring yeah. i'm not saying i'm gonna be like that but i mean there's tons of you know older gentlemen who are who are making content older uh women just older people couples whatever companies ray dalio is coming back to make content on youtube ray dalio is a creator 100 Ray Dalio is on TikTok, son. Yeah, well, you know I don't think he runs it, but, yeah, but you know, still, yeah, his he stuff understands is the value of it. He gets it, and uh, he had at least approved the team to do it. You know, so I think it's not about whether I do YouTube later. I think it's about what we're doing on YouTube, and I think that this is a good segue to like we are going to be making changes to the YouTube channel. We got plans right now, and it's like it's kind of that time for a refresh. Let's talk about it. Not, not a reinvention, I don't want to say, but a refresh and maybe tweaking the brand. I don't want to say too much too specifically, but because anything can happen, you know, in this process. But Yo, we, so whatever you want to take yeah. out, we could take out. Just tell us, like, how could we be helpful? Yeah, can we be helpful If you want to anyway? just bounce yeah, ideas and shit. Yo, by the way, dog, I like this chili oil. Wait, we're rolling right now. I need Jakey's drop. Okay. I, like, I like this chili oil, you know okay. what I mean? What do you um, like about it? I, I like the I like that it has a, like a very subtle kick. You know what I mean? Um, it it, it kind of comes at the end. Yeah, it doesn't like, like a, hit it you like, right <laughs> from the top. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do wish that I could get the mala flavor a little more though. Well, I, don't, well, I don't think I. Feel that's it. interesting. See? I don't think I feel it as much as, uh, as 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 I was hoping. And that's totally fine feedback. I love that because food is just like content. People view it differently and they take things differently, and people's taste buds are different. Mm -hmm. You're tasting not as much mala. Some people told me they taste way more mala. Mm. And they're like, you know, so everybody, it hits different on everybody. It kind of depends on the food you're eating. But everybody's viewpoint and taste buds are different. Some people say I taste a lot of truffle. Some people are like, ah, oh, this, this truffle is very subtle. I don't know. As long as you like it, that's ultimately the number one thing that I love to hear. Word up. Yep. Coming back soon. Mm -hmm. Very excited for the next drop. Um... How big are each of the drops? For thousands of units. That, okay. Not not in the tens of thousands, but like low thousands That's for amazing. now. And then it's all D to C. All D to C did some, got into a couple of markets here, non-Asian markets. And, you know, we have an Asian YouTube channel that's for the community. Yeah. But it's like if, if the American retailers or the non-Asian markets pick it up first, mm -hmm. I have nothing. That's great. I'm, I'm not against that because I think this is a product that appeals to everybody and I want it in the hands of everybody but the Asians any any Asian person that wants to get it is going to be able to get are it are you guys raising money not yet so um, to talk about small off for a little bit I think we will be raising money eventually for sure uh, I think it's kind of the natural progression of things for the most part but right now we're bootstrapping it and um, it's just coming out from us right now um, as we do the first few uh, launches and then when we get a hold of things and um, multiple SKUs out, multiple products out, get everything, got all the data that we need, we're gonna uh, probably raise money. So I don't know, within the next year maybe? I what's don't know. the biggest need for the business right now? Like you said, like we said earlier, through it, like capital is not, like if I wanted to borrow some money, it's not that hard. I go to the bank, I have decent credit and stuff, you know, <laughs> or I could raise from friends and family. I'm learning more about the raising money, round, seed, all that stuff more in the past few years being in New York. This is a great place to learn about that stuff. Right. That's all they talk about yeah, around here. VC. Oh, VC. <laughs> Everybody's a VC. Yeah. Um, which is not bad in a way. But uh, yeah, so the need is um, just more exposure. I think as long as people get it, gifting it out was, was useful to my friends. And they tried it and they promoted it and they stand by it. Like I got some friends who are really big fans of it and uh, legitimately not just because we made it. And uh, I think it's going to just come down to exposure once we get the, the lockdown our margins and manufacturing is a whole different manufacturing food is. Totally. There's a whole thing like Sriracha. You yeah. saw the, the Sriracha, yeah. Sriracha lost some of that market share. It will never come back yep. to that level. And then Underwood Farms. Lots started their own yeah. sriracha that i heard tastes more like the original because the new sriracha recipe tastes a little different and that's just because the farm changed and that's unfortunate um but you know that's also business sometimes so no, totally so it looks like it's still awareness 
But I ask because you know it could be a, it could be a production thing, right? Like you, uh, we we see that all the time. Yeah, I, I don't want to say production because, I mean, I love the guys who do it. I think that I this is my first foray into manufacturing, yeah. so I'm listening to the other guys on our uh, that we're kind of partners or, or teaming up with that help us through things, and I'm listening to them because this is their life. This is not my life. Yeah, totally. Unfortunately. I always say I'm so thankful like I didn't have to quit my job to launch this. A lot of people quit their day job to launch their own personal brand. Right. Yep. I'm able to do this while I'm still doing totally. my other thing. I'm a busier than I used to be, but um other than that like you know, I'm thankful for that and I'm grateful. So, but um I don't know. Maybe I don't I don't want to say manufacturing yet. I just think like it's just a uh, yeah. It's just once you lock down the pricing and then um, getting it out. I'm itching for it to come back because I have this energy. I'm like, yo, guys, we're yeah. ready to go. Because I'm that we're head marketing. You know, we're head marketing and founders and all this stuff. So I'm like, yo, let's go. Once you send me the bottles, I'm making the content. I'm gonna ride on my scooter around New York City and sell this thing. Um, I'll get it in the hands of Jakey. I'll get it in the hands of all these other food people. You know, and then. Uh, so I guess that's what's like energizing. Man, this one quote from Kanye, man, uh, from his documentary, he was like, yo, I don't really like the word exciting. When you're excited, you make mistakes. When you're excited, you run a red light, you could crash. I wanna use the word energizing. What's energizing you? <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that scene. I love that scene, I love that quote. So what, yeah, what's going on with the future of Fung Bros? Future of Fung Bros. Um, for the pod, without getting too specific, we want to shift things, and I think it's a good time for us. I think right. being in New York, we've grown and we've done a long time. I think like maybe it's not always Fung Bros at the helm. Maybe Fung Bros always exists, but it's not gonna be like the the head of the ship, you know. And there's a new narrative, and there's a new mission, and and maybe it's a more all encompassing channel. I know we were talking about Asian networks and why we think a lot of them don't work, and I think that's a whole conversation. I've had people wanting to consult with me and they weren't paying me, but they want to be like, oh man, to come talk to me about the thing. I was like, man, I'll tell you my thoughts for like 20 minutes, man, but like 15 minutes. But like, I think there's a way that I don't want to like pitch it like it's an all Asian network, but it's got its niche. But I think that being able to incorporate more people beyond just we've always incorporated a lot of people in our videos, but it was always under like the Fung Bros TV network. So it'd be like a bar stool. Y'all want like a bar stool situation? And you're, you're gonna build a platform. not about sports and not well. Yeah, you're building like a that. platform that's bigger than you, yeah. you guys, and, right. and it may or may not involve turning our channel into that. But either way, if anybody's interested, please email us if that sounds interesting. I think that well, what, we, uh, what's the ask? So, are you looking for talent? Are you looking for uh, people with distribution? Production, a production, and, okay. and and if there are investors for this thing, I mean, I will probably be asking for investors for small ass sauce in the future. Um, but right now. If anybody has the power, that's who I want to talk to. I want to talk to anybody who's interested in that, whether they're uh, on the production side or not, you know. And uh, there's no, like, Asian male magazine, you know. There are some that tried, but I, and I, and I, I take inspiration from them, but I think that there's, there's a, you know, we're bros. We're fung bros. We've been Asian bros this whole time. Like, I don't want to hide from that. Like, we've been good bros, yeah, like yeah, good people, but yeah, 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 we're yeah. bros. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't, yeah. why am I ashamed? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no totally, yeah. Totally. And I think that there is a good opportunity yeah. to have a lot of those healthy conversations um, that are needed. You know, I I lurk on Reddit. I lurk on Twitter. I know what... I know a bunch of Asian guys. I know a bunch of people of all different types. I read a lot of the comment section. The comment section is not always true. It's sometimes people's worst side, but there is some perspective um, right. to gain from it. And I just feel like there's a need for this. Mm. And it's beneficial to a lot of people. And it's cool to get a lot of brands involved and um, more brandable content, um, I think, is in the future. But... That's to just kind of put it like, what's your timeline on this? I don't know. Because we talk question. about we talk about should smart. I should I have a should I just mark a deadline, or do people work better with a deadline or time? Because we because we always talk about like smart goals, right? You know, like simple, measurable. Oh, smart goals! I thought you were talking about Marco. No, no, smart. Marcos, oh, shout yeah. out to Marco. Yeah, Marco's. Yeah, love, yeah. Love smart Marcos. goals. 
you smart know? goals. Yeah, that we always talk about smart goals. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, I was just wondering if you had like a timeline for how you want to execute on this. I mean, I don't see why we can't make headway in the next year. Gotcha. What's your? Shouldn't take more like with technology now and the. We can do it. Can you walk us through your team? What's your team look like? It's pretty slim right now. Yeah, it's a small team. Um, there's a cost of doing business in New York City that I think we all have to acknowledge, even though we all love this place. Um, so but it's, so it's you, your brother. We got one guy in house, and then I got some remote editors. So uh, pretty, pretty slim team. Do you have a man? I do some editing. Agent? Yeah, I have a uh, Mylin Yamamoto from Click Now. That helps us. She's more of like a deal agent and like someone I've been working with for a long time. Really great, great person. How long is long? Since the 99 Ranch deal. Wow. So for a decade oh, plus. For a day decade. One. Yeah, yeah, 10. Day, day one. one. Maybe nine, yeah, nine and a half, that. 10 years. I respect that. Uh, but that wasn't day one I got it. But anyways, day long one, time. Day one brand deal. Yes. Day one brand deal. Yeah. Long time. Anyways. Um, you know, our 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 content right now is pretty has a pretty low overhead, but I think that with even the new technology, the new camera equipment, new microphone, lavalier equipment, it just gets better and better every year, man. And it just makes it easier and easier to create good content. Like you can put a green screen on Instagram, you can put yourself in whatever setting you want. There's AI design, there's AI caption apps, there's uh, like camera phones are looking better and better. You can plug a lavalier mic into your phone and do all this stuff. So, um, like we were talking earlier, like mainstream big bazooka cameras is maybe movies. That's it. But even the creator was shot on FX threes. That, exactly. That's the camera I use. Yeah, yeah. It's you right know, there. probably with like a twenty thousand dollar lens. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. The crazy editing, yeah. but you can but do the it. body is. So the body, that's the body, yeah. yeah. So that's a three thousand dollar camera or something like that. How uh, often are you guys? What's your production schedule right now? Uh, we film probably like four days a week, and we try to leave a day. First of all, we work weekends always. I'm working all the time, but work. I always tell my girl, I'm like always working, but it's not like insane work. Yeah, same. Like it's the same thing. When you're a creator, you never stop thinking about 100%. it yeah. and texting people, scheduling people. You schedule 100%. on the weekend, but. It's not like you're doing surgery for no, yeah. <laughs> seven yeah. days our, a week. Our work doesn't shut off. Like yesterday, I was replying back to DMs till like 2 a.m. on the Righteous Eats And, and you can argue, th and those DMs are work-related. Yeah. yeah. I, I can say that it's, a, it's you, work. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you're talking to a restaurant, you got to schedule, hey, when you're there, yeah. it's whenever that person's up. And you just got to get stuff done. So yeah. I was sending edit notes yeah. to one of our editors till like 1 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. So... But after I had TV time with the lady, yeah. so she went to sleep, and now I have my own time. Right, right. So you right. know what I'm saying? So it's like it's not like we have well, a regular later, nine to five. Who you texting? I'm <laughs> restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real though. Like yeah, so yeah, we don't have a typical nine to five where we shut off after five. You know, no. if anything, you shut off after five. Take, take a you break. Work, take a break, <laughs> and then you work again. You Turn know? back on at nine. But ten. the beautiful thing about all of this, Andrew, that I. I'm sure you feel the same way is that at the end of the day is yours. Like this is your shit. Entrepreneurs like, ain't nobody right. could tell you nothing about it. You know what someone told me? Oh, this is funny that a lot of, cause there's so many creators in this space, uh, like doing this thing now. They were right. like, my friend was like, yeah, one of the people, one of the couple, one of the, in the couple, one person is a creative, one person got the corporate of course. insurance. And they're just like, and that's just like, an unspoken rule in New York. It's kind of like the old school Korean. So the Korean uh, gentleman that used to own small businesses, and I'm sure it was similar in the Chinese community. The dads would own the beauty supply stores in the hood, and the moms were the nurses. So you know what I mean? Insurance. So the moms brought the insurance, you know, got the pension and all yeah. that, and then the dads would own and operate multiple beauty supply stores. So it was like a common. So I just thought, oh wow, this is like an extension of that. You know, I mean, the, is your is your girl in corporate? Yeah, she's a dentist. Yeah. There yeah. you go. So all, <laughs> you know all, all, all three of us at bonk, the table. Bonk. My, my wife's a lawyer. Yeah. She when people say that, I'm like, <laughs> what's your girl do? Is she another influencer? I was like, you know, I, I like met up with a couple of influencer girls. That's eh, not really my speed. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, I was like, oh, she's a dentist. Oh, you got it made, man. I'm like, she might have it made. We'll wait and see. Hold on. Right, right, <laughs> like, right, 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 right. But 
Uh, yeah, it's 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 uh funny. You need that balance, and um. Well, the line is literally. My wife literally will say, "Well, someone's gotta have health insurance." Yeah, that, that's that's what it is, right? But hey, man, partnerships work in so many different ways. Yeah, you need a yin and a it's yang a balance out. It's a you know, you you also gotta you also gotta make her life more fun and interesting, though. That's probably part I mean, of your job. I don't know if I do any of that, but um, because <laughs> we're working all the time. Yeah. Yeah, but, but at least you get free food at restaurants sometimes, right? People comp it. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah. now, nah, but it's, see, we put ourselves out there as the guys that always pay for meals, so I don't even feel comfortable oh, eating free meals. Yeah. You know I, mean? so we we don't, I don't. I don't get free meals. You I don't get, get free meals. Yeah, we I, get free I, meals, and then we end up having to tip over. Tip over. Right? Yeah, no, yeah, that's yeah. true. That's what I, you end up kind of paying for yeah. it. Yeah, we pay. Bro, we probably pay more. I guess. Like, uh, what do you like that you're seeing from Asian creators in America? What do you like that you're seeing from the next gen? And what do you like that you've seen from even the past gen and what, how they're evolving? Is there anything in particular that comes to mind? Yeah, number one thing is scale. I mean, the best Asian creators aren't Asian creators. They're global creators. Mm. So they, they, they certainly have a, a center and a core. You know, they're, un, they're unshakable in who they are and the story that they tell. But the, that message resonates to everybody. So, I mean, look at like, I mean, even, even the stuff like, you know, it's funny because we live in a post Rami world, but like A24, Rami, like all, all the all these things, right? Like you 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 look at that and you're like, that's not a that's not a show about like a Muslim guy. That's that's just a show about some you know what I mean? And and you see that over and over. Whether you're short form doing like we I'll, I'll mention Vivian again, right? You're rich BFF. Sure, she was a banker, like did that did that whole thing, but like, yo, what she's trying to do and give game for, that's like for everybody. You know what mm. I'm saying? And I think um, I mean same thing with what we do, righteous eats. Like again, I think majority of our audience, I mean, there isn't like a specific pie chart that breaks down the ethnic background. But if I look in the comment sections, if I look in the DMs, majority of them are non-Asians. Mm -hmm. So I think again, like I don't think you have to sway away from the fact that like like kind of what you said, like old school <coughs> comedians hiding the fact that their Koreans were Chinese. I don't think we're ever at that stage. Mm. I don't hopefully we'd never go back to that stage. But we are at a point where, you know, having this monolithic silos, a squad of, you know, coming together, like nah, like you actually have to start shaking hands and kissing babies outside of your immediate circle. Mm. You know, and I think that's happening in the creator space as well. Any disappointments that you guys have seen, like having been in the world for a long time, is there anything you wish you saw from the Asian community that you're like, that didn't really come together? Yeah, organization. I, I think organization is-, is Amongst who? Organiza we don't have systems in place where- I think that some of the rich Asians kind of failed us in that category. No, well, again, so, so okay, let, let's, let's take a step back. The first thing that I'll say about, my first disappointment about- sort of the existing scene from before when I was coming up is that um, it's a it's a narcissism of small differences, right? Yeah, so, that's a big one. So, and that's a huge one, right? So if one. I'm working at a company, like if I'm working as a uh, hip hop A&R, right? And I'm that guy, then I'm looking at JK, I'm like, who, who the fuck? There's, there's, only only one, there's only one Asian yes. in hip hop anyway, and now we're at the same company. Who the fuck are you? Mm -hmm. There's only one Asian American, whatever. There's only one, I'm the Korean guy, dude. Who, who are you, right? Yeah. So then there's a bunch of that. And, you know, to the to the broader point, like, our audience, our audience, here's the thing. He's fluent in Korean. So am I. Like, I'll, that fluency is there. But the reality is our audience is not Asian. And it's, no. and it's because in many ways, because that narcissism of small differences, we get put on by, like, by Jewish people, by, by, by Senegalese people. We get put on by all these other groups. And then we get the phone call from, like, you know. Current American, da 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 da. Yeah, so right? like we then, get then the we get the, then we get we the, get the New York Times cover first, and then we get a call from Gold House. You really? know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's like 100%. that. It's that flip. It's like, wait, did that actually happen? Yeah, I mean, like wow. an email is like after the New York Times article went out. You know, we got an email it's like, hey, we're doing these Gold House activations in New York. Can you pull up? And it was like, yo, that's funny style because we know like a bunch of people that's on your board. You know what I mean? And you probably looked at us as. Oh, he's the crazy YouTube guy. He's the Asian kid with the deep voice and the fake accent. They probably categorize <laughs> as that. And then they saw, oh, shit, white people fuck with him, actually. <coughs> let's let's will yeah. him back in. I mean, it was the same thing with Nora, right? Like, the Asian, you know, creative community didn't fully embrace her when she was making songs called and My they, Vag. And they still don't. 
and and now yeah. you know because she's Hollywood Nora, they're like, oh, like you're one of us now. Yeah, you know, yeah, and there yeah. there is that constant repeat of they they need white validation exactly. in order for them to say that yo you're one of us. It's, it's tough. Like, why do we need that? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, I think I'm sure you got. Well, we all understand why, but we are not happy with the fact exactly. that exactly. Yeah, being immigrant kids, minorities in here. I think Asians also being very high, uh, high uh, achievement oriented. We look at what's high. Well, even we we're in Asia, we'd be looking at the top person in Asia, and they would just be Asian though. Yeah. So I think Asians just bring that same high achievement geared mindset to America, but when we look up, it's not Asian. We just bringing that. Oh, I want to shoot. I want to get higher, and then we see that, and then we're buying into that, and that's where. A lot of people get that from. I think that's a. There's other reasons, but that's yeah, yeah. a lot I, I of it. I see your right? point. Yeah, I see your point. And, and it, but that and that's why I just point at rich, successful Asians that made it. And I'm talking about they got generational money now. So it's not like your money's gonna uh, be lost if you make this decision or if you hook up this Asian. I think Asians oftentimes they're so achievement oriented and they weren't grown raised with kind of like that squad me mentality or that like bring everybody up mentality that a lot of the older people who made it, they still have trouble putting people on. And I think that's part of the disappointment maybe that you guys are getting at that I, I feel like. I'm like, they didn't put people on as hard as they could have. Now that's easy to say because I'm not in their position, of course, but I just feel that way. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, And they're not doing enough for well, other Asians. Well. I, I try to look at it from their perspective as well. Like, let's say if an OG hip hop writer that when I was in a writing game, there were big bros that looked out for me, but there were also people that didn't really show me uh, much mentorship or interest. And I look at it from their perspective. They probably looked at me like, yo, this motherfucker is like rough around the edges. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't really know. Like, I'm still trying to hold on to this little pie. Right. That no, I got. and I get it. If me they're affiliating myself with this fool, yeah. that might tarnish that. So let That's me just true. keep it to myself. So I always, I also try to look at it from their angle, too. It's like, yeah, me at this age, like, I get, you know, young, like, you know, like, Asian rap, trap rap, drill rap motherfuckers like with face tattoos coming up to me like, yo, big bro, look out for me. I feel I feel the same way. Like, yo, I, dog, like your name your your rap name is named after a firearm. Like I don't I don't know if I if I could really put what you if, on. You uh, know what this I mean? is just a I'm just like, a exercise. Your name is AK forty seven. Like I, I don't know if I could put you on, you know? So uh, just an exercise. What if what if you tested him and was like all right, you really want me to be big, bro? Well, yeah. if you're going to be little, bro, and I'm going to put you on in any shape or form, connect you with anybody, and put my name behind you, then, like, do this. And I think that this is, a, like, do this for me or do this task. And I think that nowadays, I think because so many kids out there got dreams, like, so many kids run up to me, it's like, oh, I want to be a YouTuber. You start a YouTube channel yet? I've been thinking about it for two years. I, I don't want to be rude, but I'm like, bro. They're not respectful of your don't, time. You're not even respecting me yeah. because you didn't do it. At least show me you uploaded five. I don't even care if they suck. At least you did it. Mm. But if you didn't even do it, it's like, someone, oh, I want to do stand-up comedy. And I'm like, first of all, I'm not even like a kingmaker of that at all, by the way. But like, <laughs> it's like I'm trying to get put on. So I could put them on my show, right? But then I'm like, you do it? Do you do comedy? Mm -hmm. What's the tape? Do you have anything I can see? Like, you know what I mean? And- that goes for everybody, and I think that I don't want to say it's a younger generation, it's a Gen Z thing, but I do think a lot of people nowadays they're like they they love that presentation, like yo OG or like they don't call me that, but there's like OG YouTuber, like oh Fung Bros, man, I used to love you guys, man. Let me do this and this. I'm like cool. What do you got? Like what have you done? It don't got to be on my level, but have you done something? And they're just like I'll get back to you, and I'm like yeah, like that's all I want is like. To see that you've tried, urgency, and like, urgency, yeah, and dedication. Yeah, and like, they can. It's okay. I don't think it's wrong to have them do something for you, like small, and yeah. just be like. Then you show that they're a reliable person, and then right. it's just step by step. They do another task, and then you do that. You put them on. You help them because that's how it has to be. I mean, you, you putting them of, on cannot just be a one way yeah, street. Yeah, you could kind of explain how our relationship happened, right? Like. Essentially, I reached out to you to get insight and yeah. for you yeah. to drop gems on me, and eventually. But well, he's got to add to what you do in some way, right. or else. Well, yeah, I, I you know, 
There was an ask. There was literally an ask. I think right. you should do X, Y, Z. He did X, Y, Z. Right. I think you should do well, A, B, C now. Did he took see? your advice first. Like and, and, from that conversation that was maybe well, over coffee, yeah. you told him do something. It was you actually saw that all he did over it. the phone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you saw that he did it. Yeah. And then you were like. Exactly. And then did more and then did more and then did more. And then like, hey, okay, let's start doing stuff together. And then did more stuff together, more stuff together. And then now we do everything together. Like the people yeah. who but, want it, yeah. you can tell. Yeah. I, I mean, look, uh, this is, we're probably eight or nine episodes into this. I think three of them, one of the first things, and they're young, they're young creators doing their thing mostly on TikTok, right? First thing I tell them is like, you need to find a mentor. You need to find a mentor, a coach, and a therapist, right? <laughs> right? A mentor, a mentor. They all, they all gotta be different people. I'll break it down for you. So a coach- so I don't even have all those. Yeah, anyway. A coach should be very prescriptive, right? A coach could be very prescriptive towards performance. Something that you do already, but their job is to make sure that you're doing that specific thing to the top. So if you're working out, if you're playing basketball, if you're whatever, it's making you specifically better at basketball, something that you are already right. doing. Right? Skills coach, sure. Yeah, yeah, right, a skills coach, 100%, right? Um, uh, a therapist, they cannot be prescriptive at all. They should not be. They're there to help you work through your shit. So they're they're there to listen and and prod and poke and ask questions ask questions yeah. right but they're not they're not supposed to be prescriptive at all mm. a mentor is also very prescriptive but what they could be prescriptive in is very narrow a therapist can be wide you're talking about mommy issues daddy issues this 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 all oh. but a mentor should be very specific and very prescriptive. So like, don't go to a fucking real estate mentor and ask him how to do a fucking, you know, uh, a, a branding deal, right? Go to, go to a real estate person if you're trying to do like a commercial real estate deal because they've accomplished a very specific thing that you want to do. Mm. So anyway, my point to, to what you say, and I actually think this is a part of our responsibility as the older generation. When, when I tell the, the people that we're on, I say, hey, so find those people with the mentor specifically, you'd be shocked how many people in crazy positions want to give back. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to show that you're very serious about what it is. So I literally write out what the ask is, right? I write at the ask, I'm trying to accomplish this. You've accomplished this before in this kind of capacity. I think there's parallels to exactly what I'm trying to do and what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for one hour of your time, once a week or once a month, once a quarter. Can you help me specifically with this thing? I will promise you that I will give you my time, my respect. I will do this, 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 and this. If someone comes at you like that, even if they say no, they'll say that they'll, they should take the time. I will take the time oh, yeah, to yeah. be like, yo, yeah. I can't help you, what? but this. You know what I'm saying? Or I will help you. You know what I'm saying? But like, I think the biggest problem, so back to the Asian thing, the biggest problem is you can't help someone that doesn't know what the ask is, right? And I think for so long, because we've never had, we're, we're just in like, a, uh, we're in a mentality where we're all just trying survival to Survival mode. Thing. We're in survival mode, right? We're just running around yeah. in circles. We're just running yeah. around. We're running around and in a place of scarcity. We're not even, we're not even enlightened to the point uh, of being in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a growth mindset. Feeling that only a few Asians can go on. Oh, that Asian took yeah, the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what, yo, I've gone to uh, YJP, young, young Jewish professionals. I just gave a speech at uh, BBYO, the largest like teen Jewish high school organization, 3,500 Jewish kids, right? Right? You know how they run their organizations? Like YJP, when you go to a meeting, they're like, cool, everyone there, there's a need and a lead. That's the expectation. So it's like, hey, JK is a TikTok creator. Uh, Sung, uh, he does roofing. He's a plumber. This is a lawyer, accountant, whatever, whatever, whatever. Everyone says like, cool, what's my need? What's my lead? And you're expected to contribute. How? That's so different than what Asians do. Can I we're trying to hold on to that shit. Can I interject? Yeah. Two things. Do you think within certain, you know, in its own like, Let's just say Korean American community. There's maybe more of that, particularly because it's within community. It makes sense, which is there's nothing wrong or Chinese, whatever Taiwanese, whatever. And 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 number two, do you think that we've done a good job of incentivizing the older mentors to do that? Like I think, and I'm not as well versed. I don't want to make any statements about how the Jewish community runs, but like as far as like they have the system set up, everything's organized. Like oh. I have friends who did this, and yeah, like it's very organized. Did the organization come and did we incentivize the old heads or older guys to help the younger people enough? Did they feel like they were gonna get something from it? Recognition, more success, or just do they have to do it out of their own altruistic heart? What do you think? I think that we try to incentivize some of it, but like anything else, like you have to be you have to truly believe in 
it as an investment and, and a growth and, mindset. Yeah, and a growth mindset yeah. and, and, and commit to it. Yeah. You're talking about 50 years, you know, 60 years, 100 years. Can you can you put that kind of a commitment in? By the way, like, you know, I think about birthright, right? Birthright, all the Jewish, if you're Jewish, you get to go back to Israel. Or birthright like, citizens here. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have you have that. Like anyone that's Jewish anywhere in the world can go back to Israel on Israel's dime. Do you know that? Like that's a that. thing, that's right? Crazy. That, okay. That's crazy. That's well, a thing. So it's partially American tax dollars, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but my point is uh taiwan has love boat yeah and and korea used to do the same thing right but like i don't know if people are getting pregnant on these things i don't know if like fine I, I, at least it's yeah, something yeah whatever it was it doesn't matter because the commitment's still not there anymore because yo i'm in rooms i'm in a record meeting i'm in a uh studio meeting and it's like josh cohen sit next to Ben Hindeman, and they're like, hey, wh oh, what's up, man? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Syacid. Oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Westwood. Oh, cool. Where'd you go to camp? Oh, da, 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 da. And they're camp. already speaking a whole new fucking language, bro. Like, you know? And then you're out of it. And you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And you're like, what? You're, you're, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like that whole like Ivy League connections. Yep. They say that 2% uh, two percent of the American population go to prestigious high schools, but 40% of Ivy League students come from that 2% of high schools. Exactly. You know and I mean? think about the presidents. Yeah, so Only it's, it's, it's zero point one percent. So there's a pool. There's a small pool, and again, like we could talk about oligarchy. We could talk about the separation of power. The old the, systems that so, are in place. So yeah, man. like I mean, I didn't implement the system, no. and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but this is how it's working. This is how it's been running. So if that's how this system is moving, the practical mindset that I have is okay, cool. What can we learn from it? How can we adopt it to the best practices that we can?